This took place when I was 14. I had just started 8th grade. I grew up in southeast Texas, and as I'm sure many of you all know, fall is still very much part of hurricane season. It was a Friday night, and it was just me and my mom at home. My dad was out of town for work. I originally had plans to go spend the night at a friend's house, but there was a tropical storm coming, and my mom decided last minute that she would rather have me at home that night. I was pissed. Tropical storms weren't normally looked at too seriously. I honestly felt like she was overreacting. Of course, this was my I'm 14 and grown up mentality at work here. My mom did feel bad, and so we rented a bunch of movies and ordered a pizza and got a bunch of ice cream for a great night in. My parents' bedroom was on the opposite end of the house from mine. This is important for later. We lived in a split-level house. The house I grew up in was built in 1950, and it was a postmodern style. Think Frank Lloyd Wright. The entire back of the house was all floor-to-ceiling windows. Think of just a huge wall of glass. The whole house was an open floor plan, so the kitchen was the first defined room with walls on the first floor, and my bedroom was directly off of the kitchen, while my parents' room was at the top of the stairs. She'd gone to bed around 10pm, and I went to my room to watch two movies that I'd rented just for myself. The storm was really starting to kick into high gear. The wind was picking up, and it was raining sideways. I was in the middle of watching The New Guy, and I still remember looking at my clock and it said 12.53am. I was getting tired and could feel my eyes getting heavy. With the weather so bad, I remember thinking that maybe it wasn't so bad I had to miss a sleepover. I must have dozed off, because the next thing I remember is a huge crash. It was one of the big windows in either the dining room or living room. Our neighborhood was in a really wooded area and I thought a tree or branch had fallen in the storm and had broken one of the windows. I left my room and went out through the kitchen. Right as I was approaching the doorway from the kitchen to the dining room, I could see my mom coming down the stairs. I saw a man standing in our dining room covered in broken glass and blood. Due to where he was standing, I couldn't get to my mom. He was young, early 20s, and he was soaking wet and had no shoes on. He had literally run through our window. He was bleeding all over, had glass sticking out of him, and was standing barefoot in a bunch of broken glass. It took him a second to register both me and my mom, but when he did, he immediately launched into an explanation of how he was being chased by someone who wanted to kill him, and that we needed to call the cops. My still fairly innocent 14-year-old brain didn't doubt this at all, but my mom was eyeing him suspiciously. We move into the kitchen, and my mom grabs her purse and my arm to keep me close. I'd grab the kitchen towel to try and help us bleeding. My mom pulls out her cell phone and starts calling our neighborhood patrol. I notice this, and so on our landline I call 911. We both finish our calls, and now we were just waiting. The guy couldn't sit still and kept getting up and looking through our kitchen windows and pacing back and forth. He didn't seem to notice that he was all cut up and bleeding everywhere. He starts muttering under his breath. What happens next happens really fast and becomes a bit blurry, but the doorbell rings. It was our neighborhood patrol that my mom had called. The doorbell sent the guy into a panic. He jumps up and suddenly he grabs a hold of me. He has me in a chokehold and my mom is now screaming to please let me go. He starts looking around all frantic and is pulling me through the dining room and living room toward our stairs. At some point, the bell rings again. My mom is following, still begging to let me go. He has me at the stairs and my mom has the choice now to go to the front door to open it or to follow him upstairs. She runs for the door just as he pulls me up the last of the stairs. I hear our alarms start blaring. Normally we arm it at night, so you would need to type in the code before opening a door. He pulls me into my parents' room, but as soon as we get into the room, he drops me and starts to freak out. It was apparently all the lights. He starts smashing lamps trying to get all the lights off, screaming that they were burning him. 
is a small garden off my parents' bedroom, and they have garden lights they turn on at night. He takes a chair and throws it at the glass door, trying to smash it so he can get to those lights. At least that's what it looks like. I'd crawled into a corner to get away from him at this point. When he completely turns away from me to grab another chair, I make my run for it. I run down the stairs. The cops had made it into the house at this point and were at the bottom of the stairs with their guns drawn. One of them grabs my arm and pulls me out of the way once I reach the bottom and takes me outside to an ambulance and my mom. The adrenaline is coming down and it hits me what's happened. I start shaking and can suddenly feel pain around my throat from where he'd been holding me in a chokehold. There's a lot of yelling and screaming from inside, and then maybe ten minutes later, the cops come out with a guy in handcuffs. He sees me and tries to lunge at me, which was terrifying. I had a bruised windpipe, but was otherwise okay. I later learned that the guy was twenty years old and a chemistry major at one of the universities in town. Together with some friends, they made their own PCP. He'd never tried PCP before and had a bad reaction. They'd been driving to get some food when he first started acting paranoid and upset, and then at the drive through insisted they let him out, and he took off. Thinking you're being chased is a common hallucination to have when you start having a bad trip on PCP. Light sensitivity is also a common side effect in general for being high on it, but he wasn't a bad kid. He'd never been in trouble before. He was a good student and pretty much the last person you would think of to do something like this. Our house was the only one on our street that wasn't completely fenced off, and that's how he was able to reach the back in those windows. When I got older, it really hit me just how easy it is to become that kid. I had friends who wound up being chemistry majors and also DIY'd some of their own drugs. Thankfully that night didn't end up worse because it definitely could have gone an entirely different direction. This story happened about two years ago when I was 19, and my foster sister, Kyra, was 16. For the sake of this story, it's important to know that I was female presenting and hadn't come out as trans yet, nor was I presenting myself in an overly masculine style at the time. It was the summer before I was going to college, and I mostly lived with my mom and Kyra, except for every other weekend where I'd stay with my dad. Now... Summers where I am can get really hot and humid, so we had a habit of waiting to walk the docks until 6 or 7 p.m., because that's when it'd be cooler, but still light outside. On this particular evening, my mom wasn't going to be home until late, though I don't remember the exact reason why, so it was up to me and Kyra to walk the dogs by ourselves, unless we wanted our younger dog Samson to throw tantrums due to pent-up energy. Even though we lived in the countryside, and could have walked them down our street, Kyra and I decided to drive out 20 minutes to a park instead. I don't remember why. It could have been anything from being bored walking our roads to not having to deal with blind curves and hills. Whatever the reason, at around 7.30pm, Kyra and I harnessed our two dogs, packed them up in the car, and drove to the park. Let me quickly explain the layout of the park so that it's easier to understand why we got nervous halfway through our walk. This park isn't very big, but it's popular because of its loop. The entire park is surrounded by a mile-long looping road, with its attractions, like playgrounds, ponds, and a small country hall, spaced about in the inner side of the loop. The outer side is just grass, trees, and one playground at its end. Thus, it's common and expected to pass people walking the loop at least two times if you're walking in opposite directions, but not if you're walking in the same direction, obviously. Any cars on this road can drive in one direction because it's a one-way road. At first, everything about this walk was normal. I parked the car, we clipped our dogs to leashes, and we started on the loop. Every so often, we'd stop so we could take a picture of our good boys. 
particularly of Kyra trying to wrangle Samson, who pulls like his life depends on it and weaves around because he wants to smell everything. It was while I was taking one of these pictures that the first encounter happened. A man, who looked to be in his forties, walked past us, walking the same direction we were, up toward the playground on the outer side of the loop. He smiled at Kyra, nodded, said hello or cute dogs or something like that, and he kept walking. I honestly didn't think anything of it. We're at a park at a time of day where it's common to walk around due to the cooler temperature, and people where I am are generally friendly. Smiling and saying hi is pretty normal, no matter who says it. We smiled back and replied, and that was that, or so we thought. This man pressed us again only ten minutes later, directly across where we'd seen him previously, just like he did before. He smiled and said hi. This time, Kyra and I looked at each other once he was ahead of us, and shared, well that was weird, expressions. Just ten minutes earlier, he'd passed us walking towards the playground and subsequently broke off from the loop, and he'd been walking in the same direction as us. This time though, he'd cut in front of us, and he did it in a way where we had to stop to avoid running into him. He nearly touched Kyra with how close he was walking. That was already weird in of itself. The other weird part was him cutting past us in the opposite direction. The only way he could have done that was if he'd cut across the inside of the loop, since it would have been close to impossible to pass us at our certain point from the other direction if he decided to walk the opposite way of the loop than us. It came off almost like he wanted to walk by us again, but just like before, Kyra and I brushed off this weirdness. The guy could have been enjoying a rambling stroll and doing his own thing for all we knew. Besides, we had two reasonably sized dogs with us. Who'd mess with us? Not even five minutes later, this same man passes us again, once again cutting so close past us that he nearly brushed shoulders with Kyra. Again he smiled and said hi before walking off. This was, officially, the moment I decided we needed to leave. Sure, it's normal to pass a person at least two times walking this loop, if you're going opposite directions, but doing so takes a while. You have to at least get to the parallel spot on the loop from where your paths first intersected to see each other again. Both the time between running into the guy and the location we passed each other didn't match up in a way that didn't look suspicious. Plus, I really wasn't a fan of how he cut across us. The first time, he passed us like a normal person walking faster than us would albeit a little close. The second time, he cut in front of us from the opposite direction instead of walking around us, to the point where we had to stop to avoid running into him. This third time, he walked up behind us and did this weird directionally slant walk to cross the street to go in the opposite direction, cutting us off again. So yeah, I told Kyra to hustle so we could get to our car and get out instead of doing a second loop. So that's what we did. When we were almost to our car, we noticed a car creeping up along behind us. We pulled to the side and stopped to let it pass, but for a second, it stopped too. We figured he was getting ready to park, so we started walking again. The car started creeping along behind us soon after we did, so we stopped again, and the car stopped with us. This was when Kyra got nervous. We hadn't seen the middle-aged guy since the third cutoff, so we figured I'd overthought the whole thing. But here we were, with this tinted window car acting weird as hell. Was it the same guy back with his car? A different guy? We couldn't tell. Before anything could happen though, another car idled up to the one next to us and whoever it was sped up to the expected five miles per hour. We got to our car pretty fast after that, and practically picked up the dogs to get them inside of it. We got in and got out of there. My mistake, however, was neglecting my rearview mirror and the well-advised rule of not driving straight home 
If you're worried a stranger's taking too much interest in you. I was anxious, dumb, and primarily concerned with getting home, where we could be safe. Because home is safe, right? Nothing bad is supposed to happen to you there, right? Ah, uh, my naive, false sense of security. I think we got home around 8 something. The sun had finally disappeared behind the horizon, but it wasn't fully dark yet. Just that dusty purple color the sky gets before it finally accepts that it's nighttime. My mom wasn't home yet, so we got the dog some water, locked the doors, ate dinner, and chilled in the living room, talking about things that didn't really matter. It was almost 9.30 when the scariest part of this whole ordeal happened. There Kyra and I were, sitting on different couches, talking about something or other, when we noticed the ceiling briefly light up over where Kyra was sitting. An important note here is that Kyra was sitting on a small couch with her back to a window that faces the front of the house, where I was on a couch on the opposite wall where I could see a sliver of the front porch. Due to our long, slightly curved driveway, it's common to see headlights stream through that window, light up the ceiling, fade, then intensify. That means someone's just come home. So, when the ceiling above Kyra lit up, we thought nothing of it. Assuming our mom has come back from wherever she went that night, we didn't take any notice of the light skipping the final arc of someone pulling all the way up the driveway either. We also didn't pay any mind to how long it was taking our mom to come inside. Our mom has a bit of a habit of pulling in, then checking her phone for god knows how long before coming inside. After a couple of minutes, I noticed the small, motion sensor light that our mom set up on a table on the porch light up. Again, I could only see a sliver of space based on my position and the curtains. Basically, I could see a smidge of the table and the rails bordering our porch, but not its stairs or anything approaching the door, depending on how they approached it. I wasn't paying much attention either, because I assumed it was my mom. Right after the light went off, we both heard the storm door open, but we didn't hear anyone pressing the code keys of our lock or jiggle the door handle, like mom usually does right away. The moment the storm door creaked open, our two dogs jumped up and ran to the door, barking like mad. Samson, our dumb, goofball son, who is incapable of hurting a fly but a big boy, jumps up on his hind legs and scrambles to find purchase on one of the small windows in a desperate attempt to see who's outside. Immediately, the storm door slammed shut and we hear heavy footsteps on the cement of our porch. Calvin started going nuts and jumped up on Kyra's couch, standing on its back instead of the cushions to look out the window. Samson ran out of the room and went to the doggy door that leads to the back porch, which has a ramp going down into a fenced off portion of our yard. I couldn't move. I'd never understood, really, what it meant when people described their limbs turning to lead until that moment. It felt like I didn't have limbs, really, like moving wasn't an option. If I moved, I might glimpse something, or someone, through the windows. The person could see me running around the house, freaking out, and decided to come after us after all. So, I sat there, my mind steadily going blank as my heart sped up, and my limbs refused to move. In the game of fight, flight or freeze. I'm the freezer. Kyra, on the other hand, is a fighter. She spins around and looks out the window, but can't see anything because, besides the motion light on the porch, it's too dark. So, naturally, she gets up, grabs a stray dog toy, which just so happens to be a tug-of-war rope with a ball on one end, and opens the door. I tell her, very calmly, to shut the door and stay inside. She ignored me and stepped out onto the porch. She comes back inside after not seeing anything, but to my utter disbelief, she disappears to the kitchen, comes back with a knife, 
and goes outside again. This time, she's gone for a handful of seconds before coming back inside and slamming the door shut. Breathless, she tells me she went out a bit into the yard and saw the outline of a man by the run-down dog kennel we don't use anymore. When she saw him and froze, he moved. This time, she listened to me when I told her to lock the door. I managed to call our mom despite my head being empty and my limbs being lead, and she convinced me to get up, make sure all the doors were locked, including the basement, and make sure the dogs were inside. After our mom got home and looked around, finding nothing, we called the non-emergency number for the police, not wanting to bother them in case we were overreacting. Two cops came by and walked around our yard and found nothing. We got the sense they didn't believe us, but instead saw us as two overexcited girls with exaggerated imaginations. Still, they humored us and told us, after we told them about the park, that if we think anyone might be following us, or if someone's acting a bit too creepy, not to drive straight home and to check if anyone's following us. Then, they left. To this day, I'm pretty sure the only people who believe someone with malicious intent came to our home in hopes of finding two teenage girls is Kyra and me. Though, whether or not whoever it was was the guy from the park, we're not sure. But it's too coincidental, isn't it? That, the day we have multiple encounters with this guy, who goes out of his way to get close to us and a car inch along behind us. We also have an almost intruder encounter. Plus, there were too many details that didn't add up to us having overly excited imaginations. We both saw headlights, the motion detector on the porch turned on, the storm door opened and stayed open until Samson jumped up and looked out the door's window. We heard footsteps. Kyra saw someone, and the dogs don't run up to the door like that and bark their heads off if no one's there. I don't know if whoever it was at the house was the same guy that ran into us at the park. If it was, I don't know if the reason he cut in front of us as close as he did was to test how our dogs would react to him, and them not caring at all or, the first time, wagging their tails convinced him that they weren't a threat. I don't know if he was in the car that inched behind us and stopped when we did. I don't know what would have happened if Calvin didn't have a scary, manic bark, or if Samson wasn't tall enough to look out the high windows on the door. I don't know much of anything. What I do know is this. If you're out and about, minding your own business, and a stranger is taking a lot of notice of you, following you, frequently running into you or whatever, trust your gut. Don't drive or walk straight home. Meander, get to a public space, or just take your time. Pay attention to your surroundings. You never know who is watching you. This happened a few years ago, when me and my brother were both still living at home. There had been a rash of break-ins in my area in the weeks leading up to it, and several of my neighbors had been broken into. My mom had been at work all day. It was around 8.30 at night, the time she normally arrived back. I was in the kitchen, my brother was in the living room on an exercise machine. I heard the familiar sound of the front door opening and closing, and assumed my mom was back. I waited in the kitchen for the front door from the hall to open, or for her to call out. Neither happened. There were no further sounds. When a minute went by, I went out to check and found no one, and no car in the driveway. I assumed my mom had arrived home, and then immediately left for some reason. My brother, who also heard the sound, thought the same thing. Over the next half hour, I found myself thinking, Imagine if it turns out that it wasn't her, and an intruder had literally been meters away from me, on the other side of the hall door. Fast forward to 9pm, 
My mom arrives home, and of course it hadn't been her the first time. All three of us collectively freaked out when we realized that while my brother and I had heard the door open and close, indicating someone entering the house, we hadn't heard them leave. A search of the house revealed that we were panicking over nothing. No one was standing there. Our theory is that the intruder opened the door and maybe stepped into the hallway, then heard my brother on the exercise machine and hastily noped out of there once they realized the house wasn't empty. We filed a police report and got a locksmith in, who told us that the front door lock that had been installed back in my grandparents' day was hilariously ineffective, and anyone with the slightest burglary experience could waltz into the house whenever they wanted. Apparently you could almost open the thing without tools, that's how easy it was. Needless to say, we got all the exterior locks changed, bought an alarm system, and basically sealed the place up like Fort Knox. The creepiest element of this became clear only in hindsight. See, in the days immediately prior to the break-in, there had been a number of odd incidents. I thought I'd heard someone trying the back door handle late at night. Our dog had freaked out for no reason, and we found a cigarette butt on our front doorstep. None of us smoked. We think the house was being cased. Whoever did it might have missed me and my brother's presence and concluded that the house's only occupant was a single woman who worked long hours. To this day, I'm glad I didn't open the hall door and meet them face to face. This happened about 11 years ago, when my husband and I just moved into our current home. It was our first week in the new place. I just graduated from grad school and was looking for work. Our house is small but has two stories, with both bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs. It's also a back house which faces an alley. Our landlord and his wife live in the front house. My husband was heading out the door one morning to go to his job and he quickly returned inside. Did you try to remove a screen from a window downstairs? He asked. I was confused and told him no. He then asked me to come outside, so I got dressed quickly and followed him out. The screen covering a large window downstairs was bent at a sharp angle, like someone had tried to push it up from the bottom. The freakiest thing was that there was a clear, prominent handprint on the glass like the would-be intruder had tried to push up and open the window. Luckily, all of our downstairs windows have wooden rods wedged in the top half to physically prevent them from being opened very much. Analog security saved the day. We also found another window screen that appeared to have been cut open slightly at the corner. We called the cops, who came out and dusted the handprint, but nothing ever came of it. Smash and grab break ins during the middle of the workday weren't uncommon in our neighborhood at the time. But what chilled me was that our would be intruder had opted to try and break in during the middle of the night when we were both home and sound asleep. My car was in the driveway right by the broken window screen and handprint, so the person had to have known someone was at the house at the time. It was a bold move albeit a stupid one since they left an almost perfect handprint on the window. One day when I was younger, my mom and I visited my aunt's apartment. It's a giant looking house with a side driveway that leads around the back to a small parking lot for tenants with the house entrances being off to the side, facing away and hidden from the busy street. I don't remember how old my cousin and I were, maybe 8 to 12 years old, with her being slightly older. It was still midday and we were all hungry, so my mom and aunt decided to go shopping and were then going to pick up pizza on the way back for us all to eat. Me and my cousin were ecstatic as we loved pizza. Our parents left and me and my cousin stay and watch TV 
with the volume really low while browsing on her laptop. It's probably about 25 minutes after our parents left, when we start seeing the front door locks shaking. We thought our parents were back, but then we noticed something suspicious. Instead of the locks of the door quickly turning, as if our parents got back, we saw that the locks were turning very slowly to unlock. We suddenly both realized it wasn't our parents. It was definitely an intruder. We both stared at the front door silently, freaked out and frozen. I always thought those horror movies where the actors stand frozen in fear like idiots were fake, but it was this moment that proved that idea wrong. As we both stood there frozen in horror, we saw the top lock finally turn all the way after what felt like half a minute. Then we start to see the bottom lock slowly start to turn. The door was probably half a second from being unlocked completely when suddenly my cousin breaks free from being frozen in fear, sprints over to the door, and turns both of the locks to prevent the door from being opened. We dared not to look out the second story window to see who was trying to get in. We were horrified and stayed quiet waiting in the living room. We didn't say a word to each other and just sat there on the couch. It was about 15 minutes later until our parents got home where we told them the whole ordeal and they were shocked. We don't know what would have happened if my cousin didn't sprint to lock the door, but to this day, I can remember very vividly seeing the door's locks shaking rapidly and slowly turning. It was definitely very scary. One summer, I worked in the box office of a theater a couple states away from where I live. The theater was mostly out of towners, so it owned a few houses and neighborhoods around it where everyone lived. They were pretty fun places to live, actors constantly cheating on their spouses at home, lots of late nights and beautiful countryside to boot. In any case, also, small town living and all that comes with it. My roommate where I lived was a friend from high school who got me the job. We were in college at that point. He's gay, I'm straight. We had it sort of worked out to only hook up with people when the other person wasn't around. So one night, I'm out and I come home. Him and his boyfriend are at the kitchen table, both with an odd look. I ask what's up. They look at each other before answering. Then they tell me this strange guy had let him into the house. And when they heard him, they went downstairs and asked who he was. He said he lived across the street, a few houses down and that his neighbor, Mrs. Something or Other, who apparently lived right across the street, had seen the two of them fooling around through the bedroom window, called him on the phone, and said, Why don't you go and join those boys across the street? They look like they're having fun. At this point, my roommate and his boyfriend tell the guy he has to leave. After more convincing, he finally does. End of part one. I'm pretty shaken, and so are they. It explains why they were acting so funny when I came in. I'm not one to respond to things right off the bat. I have to think and mull for a bit before the initial reaction is being scared. We all stay at the house that night, strength in numbers. The next day I'm at work, taking down credit card numbers on the phone, handing out tickets in the evening when the crowd starts to arrive, and in the back of my mind, I'm fuming. How does someone get off making a phone call like that? Why is she looking in our window? And who walks into a house and does something that stupid? I'm not scared anymore. I'm really pissed. I was having a good summer and this wasn't going to wreck it. I was going to go home, go across the street, and tell that old woman not to call any more of her friends. And if she did, there was going to be trouble. So I get home. I haven't really paid much attention to the other side of the street, but I see the house. See how she looked at our window and I march across. As I get closer, I start to notice how shabby the place is. The garage door has paint peeling off, isn't closed completely either because it's warped or off its track, or both. 
The front door, as I climb up these stairs, isn't doing much better. Whatever. I pound on the door, getting ready to berate an old lady. And a guy comes to the door. Short. Fat. Glasses. Spiky hair. Somewhat creepy smile. I'm a bit blindsided here. I'm expecting an elderly woman and I get this. I'm also 19. I ask if the old woman is about. I can't remember what he says, but it ends with, Come in. I still have my prepared speech and I'm determined, and I enter. After going in, I start to realize my mistake. This place is, I mean, shag carpeting, sad sofa sinking in the middle, unopened can of Pabst on the coffee table. I turn around and the guy has the same creepy look on his face. I say I think I'm in the wrong place. He says, No, I think you're in the right place. I tell him I came to see the old woman, and if she isn't here, I want to give her a message. I'm by now fully aware that she might not exist at all, and he's standing just far enough from the door that I can barely get out. But I have to have my say first. So tell her not to call any more of her creepy friends, that no one's allowed in that house except for the people who live there and anyone we invite. If it happens again, there's going to be trouble, I tell him. I should maybe add here that I'm 5 foot 6 and probably at that point, 115 to 120 pounds at best. I try to glower at him. I storm past him, grab the screen door, again trying to trade fear for anger, open it and slam it as hard as possible behind me. Then I walk across the street, trying not to go too fast, but really just trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. When I get across the street, I ask my roommate, what did the guy look like that came in last night? He said, short, fat, glasses, spiky hair, why? For a quick backstory, my dad is a retired park ranger. He worked for the National Park Service up until three years ago. His usual tasks involve taking people on tours along the Appalachian Trail and maintaining the forestry and the wildlife habitats that live there. So anyway, the story goes back to the summer of 2003, when my dad and his colleague John were sent out to try and locate an adult elk a male named Billy by the locals, who was usually very tame and was often found close to houses but had not been seen for over a week. So my dad was dropped off along the trail whilst John took the truck and drove further down in order to try and locate Billy. They'd been searching all day for him and this was the last stop for the day as there were only a few hours of daylight left. So, as the story goes, my dad had been walking along the trail for a little over an hour when he heard a disturbance in the distance off to his left. He could hear the snapping of tree branches, so he decided to follow where the noises were coming from in the hopes that it could be Billy the elk. As he got closer, he said he began to smell a foul odor and instinctively knew that it was some sort of dead animal. He was right. Laying on the ground, in a small opening of trees was the carcass of a large elk. He could see by the tag on one of the ears that it was Billy. However, he was immediately shocked by the condition the animal was in. Billy had been severely mutilated. His eyes and tongue had been gouged out, his throat torn out, and his stomach had been ripped open so that the intestines were protruding onto the floor. He also noticed that little chunks of flesh had been bitten from the torso and the entire front right leg was missing. He reasoned that the animal had been attacked by either a black bear or coyotes, as nothing else would tackle a fully grown adult elk. However, this seemed strange because elk were usually too big for even apex predators to try and take down, but he thought that maybe a hungry pack of coyotes might, if they were starving. What disturbed him further 
was the way in which the animal had been mutilated after death, and that it was very unusual for predators to mutilate a corpse in such a way. Feeling unnerved by this discovery, my dad radioed John and told him he had located the animal before giving him his approximate location. John had told him that he'd wandered off the beaten track and that it would take him about an hour to get back to where the truck was parked and drive back to his location. So my dad was told to wait where he was until John got to him. It was almost dark at this point, and my dad remembered beginning to feel very unsettled. He had a flashlight with him and bear spray, but noted that he still felt very vulnerable alone in the forest. After around 15 minutes or so, he heard the same noises as he'd done earlier, much closer now as he was off the trail. He would hear footsteps and the occasional growl of something hidden within the thick bushes straight ahead of him. He said that every so often he could hear slow, heavy breathing and the snapping of branches as whatever it was paced the forest floor. He began to get the feeling that he was being watched and worried that the coyotes, or perhaps even a bear, was now stalking him. However, the noises still persisted, and this seemed to aggravate the creature. Luckily, the animal never came any closer or revealed itself to him, simply pacing around in the darkness and letting out the occasional growl. Just over an hour later, the truck pulled up along the trail, and my dad could see, to his relief, that John was now following the flashlight to where my dad now stood. The arrival of another person must have spooked the harasser, as he noticed hearing the crunching of leaves now moving quickly away from them. He told him what had happened, and the man reasoned that it may have been a bear, and that they probably shouldn't hang around. Together, they wrapped the corpse in a cloth, and managed to haul it into the back of the truck. My dad said that just as they were getting ready to leave, curiosity came over him, and he decided to walk over to where the sounds had been coming from only moments before. John got out as well, and the two of them scoured the area. Behind a fallen log, they found the half-chewed leg of the dead elk, along with a number of discarded candy and chocolate bar wrappers, and a small length of rope. Further back into the tree line, they found a pair of nitro gloves covered in blood and human shoe prints leading away from them. They also discovered the remnants of a small fire and a comic book. This had terrified my dad. The realization that it had been a person that had mutilated the elk, that had been watching him from the bushes and growling. So much so that he and John agreed to never mention the encounter to anyone. My dad has told me, that not a day goes by that he doesn't think about what he saw that day, and he still struggles to comprehend what the person was doing out there, in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere, how they had managed to kill the elk, and what their intentions were to my dad. We relocated from the area in 2005, and now reside near Richmond, Virginia. My dad hasn't been back since, and has said that he will never walk the Appalachian Trail again. I can't blame him, to be honest. Anyway, thank you for listening to my story. I attend high school at a religious college proprietary school. That's pretty bad because I'm actually a closeted trans person, and those schools pound ideas like homosexuality and transgenderism are sinful in nature, but I'm getting off topic. My school has a nice wooded area surrounding it, and if you follow either way in or out of the school, you'll end up in a little shopping area in the front of the school. I like to take long walks through these woods to help clear my mind or just be alone for a bit. However, I'm not sure if I can ever step foot in those woods without thinking about what happened tonight. There was a home football game this evening, my brother wanted to go, and naturally, my parents forced me to go. Law of twins. The worst law. I only stayed for about two periods, before walking around and forcing myself to socialize a bit. Even though I didn't like most of them, it was better than football. 
During the fourth quarter, or something like that, I asked my brother if I can go to the car, which was parked in the shopping area across the way, so I can start it up and be ready to go by the time he walks over. He gives me the keys to our shared car, and I make my way to it. While walking through the parking lot, I decide to take a quicker shortcut through the woods, and that's when the craziness starts. I swear I could hear someone walking behind me, but every time I turned around, I was met with an empty trail. I found this odd, but dismissed it as paranoia. I kept walking, but I began to feed this paranoia, and eventually, I was able to convince myself to speed up to a brisk pace so I can avoid getting snatched up by this invisible threat that was pursuing me. As I sped up, I realized the footsteps I kept hearing wasn't my mind messing with me, but actual reality. I looked behind me to see a guy in a black hoodie sprinting after me. Panicked, I began to pick up my pace. I could see the edge of the woods and the lights of the shopping center before two other hooded guys jump out in front of me, forcing me to take a left and into uncharted territory. I could hear all three of them screaming obscenities at me. I didn't even know who these guys were. Their voices were filled with the strongest of spite and the darkest of intent. It was horrifying. I wouldn't wish this experience upon my enemies. Eventually, I found myself in a neighborhood at the northern end of the woods. I turned around to see nothing chasing me. I stopped to catch my breath, and I started to cry. I couldn't help myself. The words they said were too violent, even if they were teens or adults. I didn't know if they were empty or a promise to something I could see in the future. After a little bit of time, I calmed myself down and walked myself back to the store across the street. I found my car and locked the doors the second I got inside. I didn't even use my phone. I just scanned the area around me making sure these creeps didn't follow me. So, hooded forest freaks, let's not meet again. I visited Yellowstone National Park last week and decided to take our boat out on the Yellowstone Lake yesterday. This was our last day and we wanted to end our trip on a high note. While we were loading our boat down into the launch pad, there were fishermen from Wisconsin catching trout, cutting them up, and throwing them back into the lake. This is a government job, aka an angler incentive program to manage the fisheries. One could tell how experienced these men were and knowledgeable about the lakes just by talking to them and watching them work in rhythm as they probably had for several years. Basically, these guys know their stuff. So, a couple of older, bigger guys were kind enough to help us get into our boat. The guys tell us to be careful. The water has big swells and it's getting windy. In a side conversation, an angler tells my dad about the bodies still lost on the lake and never recovered, including a couple of park rangers. The angler explains the water is too cold and within 20 minutes, hypothermia sets in. So again, he cautions us and we head out anyway. We didn't make it far. Three to five foot swells pushed us back in. It was almost as if the angler was expecting our short return, and he helped us guide the boat back into the dock and onto the boat trailer. He just smiled and said, I'm glad you're back. It's bad weather out there. I felt I had to give you the background so you could see why I'm so cautious about these missing people, bodies in the lake, and park rangers' bodies all believed to be at the bottom of Yellowstone Lake. However, I cannot find any information on the missing people and missing rangers. I asked other park employees and researched national park websites. I found nothing. What are your thoughts? Does anyone know anything about missing people and missing park rangers at Yellowstone Lake? So, let me set the stage. At the time I was living in Traverse City, Michigan, 
beautiful landscape for those wondering. Huge glacier-carved hills and Lake Michigan at your back. I rented a little townhouse with a longtime friend a little ways outside the city. I had just gotten a hold of my old bicycle, which I'd shipped up from my old hometown, and I was raring to start riding around. And that's how this all got started. It was my day off, and I decided to save gas and ride my bike into town. I geared up, checked my tires, and roared off. I'd been big on riding my bike once upon a time, and it came back like, well, riding a bike. What I didn't notice, however, was how quickly I was moving. If I'd been paying attention, I would have realized the constant downward slope I was on and how biking back up it would likely pose a difficulty for my winter-lapsed muscles. But none of that mattered at the time. I made it into town, did some shopping, met up with my roommate for dinner, and generally had a good time, till I noticed the sun was setting. So I bid my adieus, hopped on my bike, and pedaled off into the sunset. At first I did alright, but that aforementioned incline wore me down. By the time I reached the last leg of my journey, it was pitch black and I was walking my bike, at which point the road faced me with a choice. To my left was the regular road, which was better lit, but also a longer trek to get to the townhouse I occupied. To my right was my more regular route to and from town. I drove it every day and had used it to come into town that very day in fact. It was heavily wooded and unlit, but featured a shorter route, albeit with a steeper hill. I figured, since I was already walking, I might as well just take the shorter, familiar path. So I turned on my bike's headlamp and headed into the even greater darkness of the road, through the woods. All went well for a bit. I trudged along and cursed myself for being so stupid and overconfident with my bike. Then I heard it. Footsteps off to my right side in the woodland. I stood still and they stopped abruptly. There, in the blackness, I debated what it might be. But as a veteran of the woods, I hoped it was just local wildlife and continued on. The footsteps started up again. They stopped when I stopped, just a hint later. I started and stopped once more to be sure I wasn't hearing things. This last time, the steps continued for a solid ten seconds after I'd stopped, making me sure something, or someone, was out there. I still don't know what, though I logically leaned towards human as the gate sounded bipedal and more precise than a quadruped. With this in mind, I weighed my options. If I dropped the bike and ran towards home, it would be far too easy to catch me. The same was true even if I ran back towards town. I was not in any way prepared for a chase, and I didn't want to initiate one. My mind stayed to the utility knife I always carry in my purse, but I shoved that thought aside. I have enough martial arts training to know that the knife was a bad idea, and I was more comfortable taking whoever or whatever was out there barehanded rather than escalating things with a blade. Instead, I called my roommate who was still in town, gave her my location, and told her what was happening. She told me she'd be there in ten minutes. I hung up and started walking again. The footsteps started up too, this time faster and out of sync with mine. And that's when I got mad. I have a weird thing where fear makes me angry and hostile, and being stalked through the woods has officially punched my buttons from terrified to murderous. So I turned to the woods and roared, with a voice I didn't know I had. How about you come on out and face me, you piece of shit? I'll rip your stomach open and wear your intestines for a necklace. For the life of me, I don't know where I got the guts or words for that. It might well have been a bad move but the woods were rather abruptly quiet, and nothing came at me. I stayed still, staring hard, ready to beat the shit out of anything that moved. Nothing did. Then my roommate came on scene, 
her headlights almost blinding me as she turned the curve to where I was. I tossed my bike in her car and we hauled ass homeward. I collapsed once I got home, vomited from pure nerves, and finally fell asleep around 3am. And that's my story. I'm not sure of much, I will grant you. Was it a person, an animal? I feel compelled to lean towards the former, if for no better reason than because it sounded like a person walking. And what animal would be so precise in its stalking and winding me up? But who knows, maybe I just scared the shit out of some poor porcupine. Regardless, I'd rather not encounter it again. To give you some information about the incident, it was on Earth Day seven years ago. My best friend and I, Des, decided it would be a fun and cliche idea to go to a local state park in our area, hike, smoke some weed, go on our favorite trails, and that kind of thing. This is something we do fairly often. I've always felt safe there, and nothing has ever happened to make me concerned for my safety. Until fucking Earth Day. Des and I are driving around the park, which is fairly large, and there are countless numbers of trails to choose from, all with varying degrees of privacy. Some are busy, while some are practically secluded. Because Des and I were planning to smoke some of that sweet green, clearly we would want to pick a more secluded route that day, so we decide on one of our four favorite trails. One we call Nature's Eyeball, and we drive over to it and park. Once we get there, we notice there's no other cause, which is great. Everything is wonderful today. We grab all our stuff from the car and head off on the trail and begin our journey. The way this trail is set up is that there is a longer, wider main trail, and then at some points the trail branches off into smaller marked paths. Our favorite part of the trail is the part of it that looks like nature's eyeball, so we take a smaller side path to get to it. At this point, we haven't seen anyone else on the path. We reason that it's a good time to smoke, and so we sit down and prepare the weed. Where we're located on the path, we can still see the main trail, so we look out and see if anyone is coming. For a good ten minutes, everything is dandy. Until I'm hitting the pipe, and Des says that he sees a man getting close to us on the main trail. We quickly put everything away, and walk further down the side path to avoid an awkward encounter with whoever this person was. After waiting a few minutes, we decide that it's safe to walk back to the main trail. We actually decide that it would be a good idea to walk further down the main trail, something we hadn't done before. But it's Earth Day. Appreciate the sights, taking the nature, right? Fucking wrong. No. Once we get back onto the main trail, we start to walk further back into the woods. Des didn't say anything to me about this at the time, but apparently there was a man sitting by some rocks where the main trail split off to the side trail. I didn't notice him, but it's very likely it was the same guy we'd spotted earlier. Either way, we're walking down the trail and I become conscious of the sound of footsteps a fair distance behind us. I look back to see an older man walking the trail as well. I didn't think anything of it because it's not uncommon to meet another person far back in the system, no matter how secluded the trail is. We continue walking and I'm now aware of the fact that he's speeding up and getting closer to us while Des and I are walking at a constant pace. Still, I'm not too concerned, and off to the right of us there's a clearing that's grade A picture material, and so Des asks me to take a picture of her in it, with a tree, for Snapchat. I agree, and as I'm trying to get the perfect angle, the stranger walking behind us is now behind me. He asks if I'd like him to take a picture for the both of us instead. I'm a very shy person, so even though at this moment I'm slightly weirded out, I kindly take his offer and thank him. Q. 
Keep in mind, I'm not a judgmental asshole and don't usually base judgments of people off the way they look, but this was one creepy bastard. I'd say he was in his early to late 40s, overweight, had a trucker hat on, fucking Jeffrey Dahmer glasses, creepy stash. He also had on a plain white t-shirt tucked into his denim dad shorts. And to wrap up the package, he had on new balances with ankle socks. So Stranger Man takes the picture, we walk back over to him, look at the photo and thank him again for doing it. Instead of walking away like we expected him to, he stands there with us for a solid minute or so while she posts the photo and checks her messages. Now we resume our trail walk and this guy starts to walk directly behind us. And when I say directly, I mean he was right next to me and if I stepped to the right, I would bump into him. And I'm one who really doesn't like their personal space interfered with. Right off the bat, the guy says, You girls are two very pretty ladies. And instantly, my something here is not right switch flips on. I accept the compliment and politely give a thank you back, but I don't initiate any conversation. I only reply if he asks something that requires an answer. He begins to ask us about our lives how old we are, where we go to school, and that type of thing. Both of us lie and say we're older than we actually are, and that we go to the college that's close by. Then he starts asking more personal questions. He asks if either of us have boyfriends. I have a boyfriend, but she and I both lie and say we're actually together and have been for a long time, hoping that this puts him off actually causes the reverse. He loves this about us. In fact, he, and I quote, loves the gay community and has a boyfriend of his own. At the moment, I'm not deathly afraid, but I am quite uncomfortable and text Des, saying to make up a lie that we're heading back to get pizza. So we start to talk about this imaginary plan and begin to turn around and say our goodbyes. When he turns back, and starts to walk with us. At this time, he's walking by my side even closer than before. From this point on, every conversation topic that he brings up is sexual in nature, or he finds a way to make a sexual comment about almost anything. Everything about this situation genuinely skeeves me out and makes me want to throw up. At one point, he comments on how there's nobody out here today and how the park is so secluded that you wouldn't believe what you could get away with out here. Every single thing that comes out of his mouth is a red flag, and I want to crawl out of my skin, or for some jogger to pass us by on the trail. But we're still very far back in the woods, and there's nobody around. I think about how I could possibly scream, and nobody would be close enough to hear it or come for help. The final straw was when we got on the conversation topic of Craigslist. How fitting. He mentioned how he always saw ads in the personals about people asking to meet other people in the park that we were in for sexual favors. He even said that he's actually happened upon people having sex out in the woods, saying how sometimes it would be a man and a woman, a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. I'm terrified out of my mind right now. But if this man had intentions of doing something bad to one or both of us, I was trying to remain confident and put off a vibe that I wasn't as scared shitless as I was. So I try to make conversation and ask him what he does in that situation. If he walks past, says something, reports it, or something to that effect. And get this, this is the part that made me question my safety the most. I knew something was going to happen without a doubt. He says, oh, I just watch. Yeah, just watch. Trust me, it's better to just watch. He repeated it three times. Holy shit, I knew that I was going to die at the hands of this creepy bastard. Now I know that I need to think fast and do whatever I can to make us appear not as vulnerable and to get us out of the situation. I text Des and tell her to have someone call her, 
and to have them stay on the phone with her until we're back safely in the car. I also managed to slip my hand in my bag inconspicuously and grab my pocket knife, open it in the bag, and pull it out and have it in my hand on the side furthest from him, where he couldn't see it. I was shaking so hard that I couldn't hold it steady. Des apparently texts both her mom and dad and tells them what's going on, tries to get in touch with her mom to no avail, but her dad calls her and I believe we're safe. They're talking for a very long time. She manages to work into conversation the exact name of the road we're on and that we're walking on a trail and headed home. Everything's going smoothly until Dez's dad fucks us over completely. Keep in mind Dez's phone is broken so she can only talk on speakerphone. The creepy stranger can hear every word of this conversation. In the middle of talking, Dez's dad says, so is that man still following you on the trail? Fuck me. Des hangs up immediately. Stupid move, maybe, but she did. I ask if she lost connection, trying to play it off, and she says, yeah, the service is really spotty in the park. Then the guy says, did you tell your dad that I was following you? We're not back to the car yet, and by no means are we safe. We make up a bullshit excuse of telling her about a guy we saw on the trail earlier. Half-assed, but he buys it. And we're okay for the moment. I also mention how there's all kinds of people out here, and that I always carry my knife and taser with me for protection. You never know what could happen. Overall, we put up a pretty good front of not being innocent, easy targets, and somehow we make it back to the trailhead where the cars are. Once we make it, we say our calm goodbyes and walk quickly to the car. I can't describe how good it felt to get in, lock the doors, and just scream. To be alive, I don't know, but I can't even begin to describe the terror of that situation. I never reported it or even told my parents. My friends and my boyfriend are all aware of what happened, however. This happened back in the 90s when I was still in primary school, so I really had no clue how much danger I was in. I would have been around 11 years old, living in a regional city of Australia. For the last year, I'd been having a lot of trouble at school, getting bullied a bit by classmates, and felt really singled out by my teacher. My mom worked around the corner from my school, so when everything would get too much at school, I would literally just walk out of class down the road and onto her work site. It would take me about half an hour to walk there, along a main road. A couple of times I noticed a small white car drive past me slowly, but I only noticed this because I would see the same car go up and down the street as I was walking, and while I was sitting outside of my mom's work site. After a while, I started seeing the same car driving up my street at home, and parked along the street that my brother and I would ride our bikes around in. I don't remember thinking it was strange, because it was a small town and it wasn't unusual to see the same cars and people. It was just like, oh, there goes that car again. Anyway, my family followed a serious routine, Mondays swimming and tutoring, Tuesdays netball training, Wednesday netball game, Thursdays basketball training. Fridays we would go and see professional basketball or football, depending on the season. Saturday was my brother's basketball games, and Sundays were our day to go down to the river with friends for swimming and a barbecue lunch. It never changed unless someone was sick. So one Friday night, I'm dressed and ready to go watch the basketball game, but I can't find my shoes. I'm pretty sure that they're in the car, which is in the garage under our two-story house. To get it, I have to walk down the outside steps at the front of the house, which has a full view of the road. I walk out the front door, and at the end of our driveway is a small, white car. Now, I've never taken that much notice of the white car up until this point, 
and it wasn't uncommon for cars to park in this exact spot for our neighbors, but I just got a sinking feeling in my stomach when I looked at it. I kept walking down the stairs, and as I got close to the bottom, the driver's side door opens and a man gets out quickly. I keep walking towards the garage, and he starts moving towards our driveway. That was the point when something inside me just told me to scream for my parents and run and lock myself in the car. I did exactly that, and this guy turned around, ran back to his car, and drove off. By the time my parents came out, there was no evidence that this had happened, and they didn't believe me. A week later, there was a notice in our school newsletter about a man in a white car attempting to abduct another child from my school on the same night. My parents were very shaken and took me seriously after reading that. I don't believe he was ever caught, but it definitely taught me to listen to my intuition and take notice of my surroundings. This happened about eight years ago, and I still think about it on the occasion and wonder what had happened. The summer between my freshman and sophomore of high school, there was this boy that I liked. Being teenagers, we would sneak out in the middle of the night to this park that was really close to our houses. One night at about two in the morning, we were sitting on a picnic table on one end of the park. This park is surrounded three-fourths of the way by canyons, and the park has a playground, soccer fields, and a baseball field. We were just hanging out, and we saw two people, a man probably in his thirties, a little heavy set, wearing a red baseball cap and a white t-shirt, and a woman who was a bit younger than him. The boy I was with and I watched the two of them walk across the baseball field and into the canyon. We didn't think anything of it. Maybe that they were just going to have relations in the canyon. I don't know. Some people did that. Maybe five minutes later, we started to hear screaming. I wasn't going crazy because it startled the boy I was with too. It was nothing like I'd ever heard. The screaming was ear piercing and absolutely horrifying. After about 20 seconds, everything fell silent. We didn't hear anything, but a little while later, the man came walking back out of the canyon, but without the girl. He started walking towards where we were sitting, and we just dipped. We got the hell out of there. We grabbed all of our stuff and ran home. I don't know if he saw us, but we were not sticking around to find out. It was quite dark, so it wouldn't surprise me if he hadn't noticed anyone was there until he saw two teenagers taking off through the playground. For the next two to three months, I looked all over the internet and would go look around the canyon for anything to explain what happened. I never found anything, and I still have no idea what happened that night. This is probably one of the scariest and creepiest things that has ever happened to me. The year is 2004. I was about eight or nine. The cool thing to do was walk up to town to the local Starbucks, an area with lots of shops and foot traffic. A man in his 40s or 50s was parked near the Starbucks down a side street. He had a terrible brown clunker of a car with no license plate. I remember thinking he was a big fat man, looked quite pathetic and dirty. He called my friend and I over to his car. Can you girls please help me out? I need to get something from my trunk, but I'm too big to get back there and get it. Can one of you crawl in there and grab it? I remember he had an uneasy laugh, and he was trying overly hard to be nice to us. It just seemed fake and labored. I immediately was like, hell no, because my parents taught me better but my friend was more gullible and was going to help him. 
We approached the car and I could see his trunk was totally empty. I grabbed my friend's arm and pulled her back. I told the man we couldn't help him. My friend was a really sweet little girl and reiterated that she wanted to help him, but I refused and kept pulling her arm to lead her away. She said I was being me. A couple of the kids were walking by at the same time, so he turned his attention away from us and started asking them for help. My friend and I ran inside the Starbucks to tell the workers that a man outside was trying to get kids to crawl on his trunk. They called the police, but the man and his car were gone by the time they arrived. This was very recent. 11 days ago to be exact. I'm a fan of hiking or just simply taking walks in the woods. The only time I go alone is when I'm in the woods I live near. This day I was not. I was with my friend Lars in a walk about 3 hours from my house. We were planning on traveling around and staying at motels in the meantime. That day we decided to take a walk in a popular area for people who like to walk in the woods like me. The catch was that these woods were huge. Not really bad to us though, we were thrilled. We escaped the crowd but every now and then we would see someone walking by. We walked for a while until we got to this spot, not too different from the rest, except for one thing, nobody else was around in this section. That's why me and Lars took this turn. After a while of walking down this path, we spotted a man, a naked man. We gave each other the look and turned around. The man was slightly off path, bent over and looking at something. As me and Lars were walking back, talking about the strange man, I heard a voice behind me. I turned to see the man. He was talking to us about the bug he picked up. I got a good look at him. He was a bit tall, nothing crazy bald with a bit of brown hair beginning to grow, but completely naked. I flashed the man a smile and sped up. We got out of that place as fast as we could. Once we got to the car, we kind of laughed. Yes, it was creepy, but more weirdly funny. The car ride was nothing, so skip to the motel. As we're checking in the motel, we see the man walk in. He was a bit hard to recognize considering the fact that now he had clothes on, but they were torn up. He waited behind us in line. Good thing we were almost done checking in because as soon as we did, we went right to our room and locked it with no thought. Now it was definitely creepy. Was he following us or was it a coincidence? We both decided we weren't going to stay at this hotel for more than a night. Hell. I didn't want to stay one night if it weren't for Lars telling me it's okay. That night, Lars wanted to go outside for a cigarette. I don't smoke, but no way was I going to stay in this room alone. I followed him outside and we chatted for a bit. After a few minutes, I see the guy walk out the doors. Lars put out his cigarette and began to walk inside, but before we got in, the guy pulled out what was probably a knife or something else sharp and he started carving through his sleeve and right at his arm. I saw liquid trickling to the ground and I immediately knew it was blood. I rushed into the lobby and Lars got the idea and followed. We alerted the staff but by the time they got someone to come out, he was gone. To this day, I still have so many questions. Did he follow us? Why was he naked? Why was he doing that to himself? I will probably never know the answer, but honestly, I'm still spooked. I don't know what to do if I see him again, but I hope I don't have to think about that. I live in a major US city. I made the move here during the pandemic, and as there wasn't much going on, 
I made the habit of having some beers and food at the local lakeside park near me. You see and meet all different types of people. At the beginning of this year, on a day that wasn't too wet or cold, I made my way down to the lake. I brought a sandwich, a couple of beers, and was listening to a true crime podcast. I found a little group of trees, pretty dry and pretty out of the way. I was hard to spot, so when I noticed this man walking towards me, I knew he was going to ask for a cigarette. Even from a distance, he seemed weird, so I thought, I'll give this asshole a cigarette so he doesn't get pissy about it and let him be on his way. Sure enough, this guy offers me some Doritos in exchange for a cigarette. I say no to the chips, but tell him he can just have one, just to get him away and be done with it. He introduces himself, and we launch into a meandering conversation. He's weird, and I can't shake the feeling that this guy is off, but the conversation itself is pretty normal. I just don't want to get this guy angry when there's not a lot of people around. Two hours later, after talking about all sorts of stuff, I finally excuse myself and leave. Less than a week later, I'm having a post-work beer at a bar when I hear a voice. I look up, and there he is. I tell myself, screw this, if this guy tries to corner me again to talk, I'm going straight to the bartender to get him off my back. I'm here to chill, not chat. It does not get to that as he whines about the TV, the music, the price, to the point the bartender kicks him out before he notices me. When he did get angry, he really got aggressive and was ready to fight. I knew it. A few weeks later, the bartender tells me a story. He'd run into an old-time regular who seemed frazzled. He explained that while walking to the park, he saw some guy who recognized him. Hey, you're Chris, the regular from the bar back in the day. The regular denied it, said he didn't know what this guy was talking about. Why? Because turns out, 30 years ago, this asshole abducted a woman, kept her alive long enough to make sure she told him the right information to make ATM withdrawals with her bank card, killed her, and dumped the body. He got caught because he was driving her car around, with her blood all over the back seat, making maximum daily withdrawals from the same ATM every day. When he got caught, he bragged about how they'd never find the body. They never have. The bartender and I were able to corroborate this story because we found some articles online about the murder, mugshot and all. The guy looked 30 years younger, sure, but it was him. This happened a good few years ago, when I was 15 or 16. I just seen a friend off at the train station, and I was walking through a small park that linked the station to the city center. An older man was walking along the same path, heading in the opposite direction. As soon as he saw me, he made a beeline for me, grinning from ear to ear. I was a little wary when he stopped to talk to me, but then I went into full creeped out mode when his first sentence was. Can I see your belly button? Obviously I declined, though politely, as I've always been small and there was no one else around to help me if my refusal made him angry. He reiterated the question and I said no again, still kind of trying to brush it off as a joke. I tried to step around him and he moved to block my path. He asked to see it again, almost pleading now. When I said no a third time, he grabbed my top with one hand and started trying to wrestle it up, using his other hand to start scrambling at my navel. I managed to squirm free and legged it to the city center. I don't know if he made an attempt to follow me. I didn't pause or look back until I reached my bus stop. That's it. 
short and not so sweet. I still feel kind of weird about people touching my navel. My husband and I, with our kids in tow, recently moved to a new city. It wasn't completely new to me as I'd grown up in the surrounding areas. The move was hell with two toddlers and I knew they must have been having a difficult time. However, my husband and I just wanted to get everything unpacked in the new house before anything else. We made sure to unpack the kids' toys first. After all the unpacking, the kids were beyond restless. We had a hell of a time just keeping them from breaking some of the stuff during unpacking. You know, because kids don't want their toys. They want boxes and anything that isn't theirs. Needless to say, we were all a little restless and a bit agitated. I immediately thought we should take them to a park, meet some other kids from the area, that kind of thing. I remember when I was a kid, there was a park in tow that was just amazing. In my memory, it looked like a giant castle, the same size as a two-story house and had all sorts of extra swings, tire tunnels, all that stuff. I tell my husband and I look up directions. We get in the car and head off to the park. The closer we get, I start to notice the neighborhoods were in some state of disrepair. The area had been hit hard by hurricanes in the early 2000s, and it seemed quite a few had not been able to repair their houses, thus the decline of the neighborhoods. I felt bad to see such a nice area become so broken down until we had to stop at a red light before the park. An older woman was standing at the bus stop on the other side of the road of the driver's side. Her clothing was a bit ragged, and at first, it pulled my heartstrings enough to ask my husband to let down the driver window so I could ask her if she needed some water or something. It's hot as hell down here, even in spring, and I've worked with the homeless before. My husband was resisting, while I was thinking I should tell her she could get free water at most fast food joints. When she starts screaming and pointing directly at us, and then saying some vulgar things to us, it was a bit unintelligible because my husband had never rolled down the window. Well, of course I'm a bit uncomfortable, but I know a lot of homeless are mentally unstable, if not worse. I'm with my family, and my husband decides that now, is not the time and place for my soft heart to help someone. I agree. Looking back at my kids who completely ignored the scene and were excited about the park they could see. We get to the park and just like the neighborhood surrounding it, it was terrible. My husband and I aren't stupid and we take turns when going to parks to check the playground equipment and surrounding play area for anything harmful. Needles, misplaced metal, anything sharp, and that stuff. It might sound like we're paranoid, but I can't tell you how many times we've actually found stuff like crack pipes and that. Surprisingly and thankfully, my husband came across nothing, and so I start explaining the rules to my kids before we get outside. We aren't too overprotective. We want them to have a bit of independence with an eye shot but they are only two and four. My husband also checked to see if he could see the woman, but the bus had stopped, and after it had left, she was no longer there. We get out, and we decide we're going to shadow the kids today to keep an extra close eye on them. Well, my son loves the swings, so after a quick game of chase, we head for the swings. We were there for a few minutes, counting, talking about the sky and such. I looked around to see where my husband and daughter were when suddenly through the tunnels comes that older woman. Well, it scared me. She crawled out in a weird way and she was talking in a raspy voice the entire time. I decided it's time to leave and get my son out to find my daughter and husband. Well, about this playground, the interior of the castle 
has all the towers and swing sets, with the wooden castle gates surrounding it. Safety for the kids, since there's a major street right next to the park. So as you can guess, we are blocked by this woman, who's coming towards the swings with her head bent down, still mumbling. I put myself between my son and her before we pass, and just as we're about to pass, she jerks her head up and begins to scream at us. I scoop up my son, still blocking him from her, and I start to run toward the exit. I shout for my husband and feel my shirt being pulled back. Luckily my husband was already coming toward us, with my daughter after hearing the scream. Out of instinct, I jerk away and reach for my pocket that has my small pepper spray can and hold it up until we can all get to safety. My husband takes the kids. He knows I know what to do and how to protect myself. I'm facing the parking lot and see my husband has gotten the kids in the car. Luckily, she decided to wait for some reason until my kids were out of earshot to threaten my family. She seemed particularly keen on threatening to kill my kids, which internally makes me want to do horrible things to her. However, I stay neutral, refusing to give a reaction. This woman is obviously hostile. I'm gently talking to her. I'm not here to hurt her. I ask if she has any family or if she lives around the area. She completely ignores it and continues on with her incoherent rambling with threats intermingled. I refuse to pepper spray her because she hasn't really physically hurt me and she was keeping her distance. My husband apparently called the police because as we were at a standstill for a few minutes, two cruisers pull up. They pull next to my husband who points them in our direction. They come over and take her away. She doesn't even struggle. My husband had moved away at this point, so the woman wouldn't have been able to see our car as she was being arrested. So I wait while they get her in the car. Before she gets in, I see her glance to her left and squint. I come out of the playground with another officer from the other cruiser, and she's looking at our car, which is parked by some trees. I look back as they're putting her in, and I see her mumbling quietly, trying to get another view of our car. As I'm giving a statement, I let the officer know about my fears about her getting too good of a glimpse of our car. He shrugged, cause what can you do, you know? He let me know they'd keep an eye on this park. They reassured me that she'd probably be in custody for a while and then forget about everything. About a month later, the incident wasn't forgotten, but not fresh either. We never go to that park anymore, just in case. One day I'm in front of the house with the kids, showing them how to pull weeds from the garden. We're having a good time getting dirty when I hear a woman shouting angrily about a block away. I stand up and staying calm, tell the kids we need a water break. We brush off and as we're going inside, the yelling gets closer. I turn and look at the crossroad on our street, and sure enough, it's that woman. Her head is shaved now. That's not terribly important, but I can't shake that part. I get the kids inside, and she comes to stand by our house on the road. She screams, and I'm barely making out anything. However, I do hear her say she's found us now. She won, and now it's her turn. I obviously call the police, but as I'm on the phone, she sprints off. I let the dispatcher know which way she's heading, but refuse to go outside and keep watch. An officer arrives to make sure we're safe, and he stays in our neighborhood until the end of his shift to make sure everything's okay. A week or so passes without incident. I still refuse to bring the kids out front, just in case. Our backyard is fenced, so that feels safe enough. The next weekend, we're all outside just relaxing when we hear banging on our front door. It was so loud, we could hear it from our backyard. My husband takes over at this point, 
goes inside to grab his gun and checks the front door. I gather the kids' clothes, but I don't go inside just in case there's an altercation. The knocking stops, and I figure my husband is dealing with it. I keep a hold of the kids by telling them a story, when suddenly I see hands above our wood fence. It appears to be someone jumping up to grab on. I get all of us inside and let my husband know what's going on. I call the cops, and he heads out front to the vents. My husband comes in and says she ran off. I knew immediately it was that woman. I asked my husband about it, and he confirmed what I thought. He also told me there were thin scratch marks on the door and a puddle of piss on the welcome mat. Lovely. The cops arrive and we give them everything we know, even telling them about the urine on the mat. It's been a whole month without incident now. Hopefully, she's gone for good. That night, I was hanging out with three friends, Sarah, Nick, and Mary. We were celebrating Nick's birthday at his place, which happened to have a hot tub in the backyard. After a couple of hours and a few too many beers, we jokingly suggested skinny dipping in the hot tub as some kind of birthday present. It would have probably stopped there if it wasn't for our drunkenness. So we did eventually say, screw it, let's do it. Now, for context, Nick's house was by a forest and was very isolated from neighbors. Adding to that, it was maybe past midnight, and anything past the Christmas lights of dubious quality that were spread around the yard was basically pitch black. All being scared, going out there without Nick's parents' home would have been unimaginable if it hadn't been for the wonders of inebriation. So, semi-reluctantly, I followed my friends into the night with a towel on my shoulder. We reached the hot tub that was worryingly close to the edge of the woods, and we started stripping. Everything was fine for the next 30 minutes or so, apart from the occasional branch cracking. We were having fun, telling stories or rambling about stupid stuff, and the fear quickly faded away. That was until a deafening shriek came from the darkness of the forest, lasting for about five seconds. It sounded like a human voice, but it almost didn't sound like a person. We all went pale and became silent for what seemed like hours, and I even saw Nick lose his boner in a matter of seconds. We all went pale and became silent for what seemed like hours. We didn't dare try to look into the forest, except for Mary, who got brave out of nowhere. She picked up her phone to use the flashlight. We couldn't help but follow the light as she pointed it at the forest, who seemed unaffected by it, as if the darkness was swallowing it. Nothing. As we were about to stop looking, though, the void stared back at us. Mary shined her light far behind Sarah, and it reflected on a pair of eyes and a white form in the distance. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. We rushed out of the tub without even giving a single thought about gathering our clothes. Mary and I screamed. We all ran back towards the entrance as fast as possible. Nick immediately got a knife while we locked every door and window. We wanted to call Nick's parents, or the police, or anyone, but our phones were out by the hot tub where we'd left them. Seeing no other choice, Nick put shoes on and made a run for it. He'd managed to get his phone, but he heard loud breathing coming from the forest, meaning whatever it was hadn't left. What followed were the shittiest two hours of my life. Nick got his parents to make their way home, handed us towels so we could finally cover ourselves, and we gathered in the basement where there were no windows. We spent most of the time in silence, waiting for something to happen. 
Half an hour in, we heard another shriek, more distant. Only this time, it was shortly followed by knocks on the door that couldn't possibly be Nick's parents. Sarah actually started crying, but thankfully it stopped after that. The parents arrived and allowed us to sleep in the basement for safety. They hadn't seen or heard anything. They were pretty sure we just imagined it. We hardly slept, and once morning came, we went out to get our stuff. The phones, keys, wallets were all still there. The only things missing were Nick's shirt and Sarah and Mary's panties. So that left us with two possible scenarios. A weird pale pervert spied on us in an isolated area deep in the woods. Or whatever other creepy stuff that roams in there just decided to spook us. This is a story I tell pretty frequently to my friends, but to this day, I still haven't told either of my parents. I'm 23 now, and this must have happened when I was 11 or 12, because I was still in middle school. Growing up, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, mostly because both of my parents worked long shifts and long hours. It wasn't uncommon that I would even spend the night at theirs during the school week since my middle school was a few blocks away and I could walk there in about 15 minutes. As most kids, I was raised with two core, if not conflicting, principles. Number one, respect your elders. And number two, don't talk to strangers. My grandparents' house is also in an area that's about a five minute walk to the local Walgreens and about the same to a small shopping center. Remember this for later. Anyway, my grandma was a diabetic and had a broken hip at some point, so she couldn't really walk long distances. Given that my grandpa liked spending his days out on the streets, and my grandma knowing I could be trusted to walk from school to home, she would occasionally give me money and send me on errands, either to Walgreens or the small 99 cent store in the shopping center. It was during one of these errands that I was almost kidnapped. My grandma had given me a few dollars and had asked me to go to the dollar store since we'd run out of her almond cookies and they were the only really sweet things she could eat. I didn't mind since I was just watching TV and eating. It was around 4.30 so I made the quick walk to the store, bought my items and was headed back home at around 4.45 to 5 o'clock. The streets on the corner heading home from the shopping outlet form an X, with the exit out onto the streets being right next to the crosswalk. As I was standing there, waiting for the light to change, I noticed a truck pull up to the exit, idling before hearing the engine turn off. I watched as an older man, nearing his late 40s, exited the driver's side and approached me at the corner. At first, I thought he was going to need directions, as it had happened to me before, but he just stood there watching me. I was feeling unnerved and asked if I could help him with something. He started asking me a million questions, where I went to school, what I was doing, where I was going. I distinctively remember this next part because his statements made no sense. He asked why I was ditching school at nearly 5 p.m. Middle schoolers here are let out at 3.30, which I stated, and he started calling me a liar and getting closer to me. He became very angry and said that boys shouldn't lie, and that I had to come with him so he could take me back to school. I remember being really scared because the lights wouldn't change. He was being very loud, but I didn't want to break the law by crossing on a red light. He reached out to grab me, and thankfully the walk sign came on. I ran as fast as I could across the street. I remember him yelling at me, asking me where I was going, and why I wouldn't go with him if I'd done nothing wrong. To which I replied, because I just don't want to. 
I ran all the way back home, making sure to cut through the alley and go in the back door, just in case he'd followed me. My grandma was sitting in the same spot I'd left her, and didn't notice I'd come in through the back. I gave her her cookies and sat back down to watch TV. I remember being really afraid to tell her, so I didn't. Nor did I tell my mom when she picked me up. My grandma often tells this story as though it's sweet, but she thinks this guy's intentions were pure. My mom and I are baffled that she can't see the more likely reason, but she was raised very religious and naive so she would never consider someone could do something that bad. Anyway, my grandma grew up in New York City during the Great Depression. When she was around 8 to 10, she met a man at the park who said he would give her tennis lessons for free. Being dirt poor and having no way to pay to do something like that, my grandmother took him up on the offer. They started meeting weekly and he would buy her things and they would play tennis and sometimes go out to eat and talk. He told her about how he had a daughter who looked so much like her, but that his wife left him and he wasn't allowed to see his daughter anymore. My grandma was a very cute little girl by all conventional standards, with blonde ringlets and bright blue eyes. Eventually he asked to meet her parents. They met at a store somewhere to chat, and he just bluntly told them, I'd love to adopt your daughter and have her as my own. I'll pay you good money, of course. Times were desperate, but luckily my great-grandparents were reasonable and decided it was not. Sell your child to stranger desperate. They told my grandma she couldn't take lessons from him anymore. I was eight and living in Staten Island. Back then, I would walk to the store by myself. My parents didn't really watch me and sometimes would even ask me to buy them cigarettes. One time I was walking and an old, like 70s brown Buick was following me slowly. Then close to the store, he pulled up next to me and was trying to get me to help him with something. I was a pretty smart kid who could take care of herself probably from being left alone so often, so I knew this was shady ass. I ran a few blocks until I got to the store and went inside. A few minutes later, he walks in and is following me through the aisles. I quickly thought to tell the clerk, but I didn't trust him either. I had already had a lot of bad things happen to me at that point in my life, and I didn't really trust anyone. So then I thought to use a payphone and call my parents collect. So that's what I did, and really loudly said that I don't feel safe, and someone was following me. The guy ran out of the store so fast. My dad picked me up, and he spent the rest of the day looking for that guy's car. I didn't get the license plate, so we never found him. I think about this a lot. It's not like he gave up after that. I'm sure he found a victim, and it's heartbreaking. I was walking back home from my partner's pub. It was around 4am and I'd gotten near the top of the hill we live on in the UK. I'd stuck to well-lit areas and shared my location with my fiancé the entire time. As I was walking, I heard a honk behind me which caused me to jump and I watched as a white van pulled up about 2 meters in front of me and stopped. I stopped too, watching them. They put their hazards on. They began to slowly roll backwards towards me. I began walking backwards and quickly called my fiancé, by which time they hurriedly pulled away. He stayed on the phone as I explained what happened, almost in tears, until I reached our flat and got inside. In the morning, I reported the sighting, 
but I didn't get a license plate or take a picture since I was panicking so much, thinking I would end up as another statistic if I walked past this van. I suffer from anxiety at the best of times, but I'll be taking an Uber from now on and not be walking at stupid times. This happened about two years ago. I just moved about an hour and a half away from home. The first time I'd lived away from home. I was working on a kid's activity camp. All the staff lived in two massive cabins in the woods. There were about 40 people in each, two or three to a room, so you can't imagine how big this cabin was. Anyway, everybody became really close. Some people knew each other from previous years working at this particular camp. None of us really locked our doors because we all knew each other and everybody hung out in different friends' rooms all the time. On this camp, my job was working with the kids during the day and doing evening shifts on the bar which was there for the staff and the teachers and the parents that had come with the children. One night, my roommate and I were both working an evening shift on the bar. She was finishing a couple of hours earlier as she was on a different shift. My roommate, Debs, decided that she was just going back to the room to read and wait for me to finish so we could watch a movie together. She'd been gone for about five minutes when my phone started ringing with her caller ID I picked up the call, as the bar was pretty dead that night. The only people in there were staff. When I picked up the phone call, nobody was saying anything on the other end. I put this down to her just butt-dialing me by accident and hung up. About a minute later, I get another phone call from a friend that lived across the hallway from us. She told me that I needed to come back to the room now. So I asked the guy I was working with to cover while I popped back to the room quickly. I walked down the hallway and there were about five people just standing outside of my room. I walk inside and Debs is just standing there crying, which isn't at all like her. Our stuff is all over our room. Please know this is very weird because I'm pretty sure I have OCD. I often tidied my side and her side of the room even if she didn't want me to. She went on to tell me that her phone had gone missing. I then asked her about phoning me before I came back to the room, and she had no idea what I was talking about. This meant someone had taken her phone and knew who to call straight away. Also, when she left work, there would be no point in stealing her phone as it was literally worthless. It was a $10 mobile at the most. A few days later, we started noticing that things had gone missing, but it wasn't normal things people would steal. They could have taken laptops, Kindles, a PlayStation, and some games. Instead, all they took were my bra and knickers, some clean and some from the dirty washing. This made me feel sick, especially because we knew everyone that worked and lived there. For a few days, I kept getting these phone calls from Debs' phone, with just silence on the other end. We obviously went and reported it, and our bosses said they would look into it. We kinda got blamed for leaving our door unlocked, which I understand is being really stupid now. The creepy thing was, a few days later I walked into the staff lounge, and Debs' phone was just placed on the windowsill. Nobody was in there, and nobody seemed to be around. Well, at that point, I noped out of there as fast as I could and locked myself in my room until Debs came back. Nothing ever came out of it, and we never found out who it was, but I definitely have a feeling it was someone that knew us quite well, and they knew when we would both be out of our room. For the life of me, I still don't know who stole my underwear, my roommate's phone, and who trashed our room but I have definitely learned a lesson, and that's not to leave my door unlocked, because there are gross creepers out there.
This happened one summer when I was 12 to 13. It was before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we would stay at four hours north of our home. My father could not attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin. It was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent that all arched around in a C shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed. In the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out, even though it was August and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. The gentleman that worked at the front desk came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventure that my mother and I were going to have. Well, I remember him giving my mom the keys and saying, The bathroom window is broken and does not close all the way or lock. We thought it was strange, but kind of shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back in at dusk, and we went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get in the truck. It would not start. Strange. I will admit, at the time, it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and saying, Oh, your truck is broke. Too bad. Let me call someone. My mom insisted she could call someone and went into his office and used the phone. She called someone to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I shook our heads, confused. Oh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out. All you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mom where the breaker was. After getting the truck fixed, having another day of adventure, we came back, ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching television, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she'd packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anyone would be. We got back in bed, and about ten minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day. So I've been on Grinder for about 10 years five of which were illegal and I'm not proud of it. I've had plenty of messed up experiences. This one in particular reminds me of a story when I was at a party without my car. My phone was on 10%, but a decently hot grinder guy said he could pick me up and that we could hang at his place before he drove me home. So of course I jumped on the opportunity. Anyway, we got to his place and he got me pretty drunk but he never tried to make a move. I assumed he was going to wait and just convince me to stay the night later. Finally, my phone died after like two hours. I didn't even have to say anything before he noticed it was dead. Then he stood up and said, Well, let's go to the car then. When I asked if he had a charger I could use, he just said, No. After we got in the car, he got kind of quiet and less flirty. I spaced out, just enjoying his music and looking out of the window. I didn't even notice that he never asked where I lived, until I realized we'd been driving for over an hour. Not even towards my town, but into the canyons. It was Greater Salt Lake City, Utah area. I asked where he was going, and he just said, I thought we could just go for a drive. And my drunk ass was like, oh, okay. 
So anyway, to make a long story shorter, he ended up taking us four or five miles down a dirt road with no signs or houses until it dead-ended into this cabin with no lights on or cars outside. He parked and turned the car off. That's when the dread started to creep in as I sobered up. I said I drank too much and should probably head home, but he didn't even respond. He just sat there staring at the cabin. Then he said, You said you like being kinky. You were pretty submissive, correct? Uh, sure, but I just meant like normal rough kind of stuff. Nothing wild, I replied. He started sounding a bit annoyed, and his sentences seemed a little less carefully worded, kind of like he was just spitting out the bare minimum of each thought. He said something about how some of his favorite people are those who can find pleasure in pain, and if someone goes into shock enough times, eventually it becomes like a drug and they crave more. And something about how pushing a person into the deep end is the fastest way to teach them to swim. At that point, I was scared enough to assert myself, and I said firmly, Okay, well, that sounds fun, but just not tonight. I just want to go home now. This place is creepy. And he just sighed and gripped his keys tighter. Then right as I glanced at his phone sitting in the cup holder, right before it occurred to me to grab it, he snatched it up so fast and held it in his left hand, kind of behind his head, to make it clear he wasn't going to let me near it. I made kind of this, what? Sound and he just gave me this almost. I'm proud of you, son. Half smile like dads do when they pat your shoulder or something. It was quiet, and he kept looking me up and down for a minute or so, and then got a little more gruff and said, let's go inside. I have these friends you'll really like once you meet them. You'll feel a lot better, or something to that extent. But he wasn't even trying to sound genuine or comforting like he'd been doing so well earlier in the night. Finally, I lied and spoke up a bit. I told my roommates and my friend I was meeting up with you before you picked me up. I sent screenshots of your face and some of the conversation. They're gonna freak out if I don't charge my phone and reply to them in the next few hours. I lied. I tried to not make it sound accusatory, but more like I was just worried about my friends going crazy but it was clear he knew what I was implying. At that point, he let out an exasperated grunty sigh and started the car and drove away. Driving back, I got nervous about him stalking me and coming after me in the future, so I tried to apologize and tell him I'd be down to hang out another time maybe, but tonight just wasn't great for me. Blah, blah, blah. He didn't say a single word the whole drive back. He didn't ask where I lived, but he dropped me off at a McDonald's about 40 miles from my apartment, and when I was stepping out of the car, he suddenly leaned over and gave me a hard shove. I almost fell out the rest of the way. He grabbed my backpack off the floor and flung it out of his window across the parking lot. He peeled out with the passenger door still open. He broke my laptop and cracked my phone and I had to ask a stranger to use her charger and call an Uber. But at that point, I was just so anxious to get home. I didn't give a shit. What's so weird is how, while it was happening, even though I was terrified, I guess I wasn't thinking about exactly what he was planning to do with me. I just knew I needed to get away. So it wasn't until I got home and got in the shower that I realized how messed up it all was, and what might have happened if I'd let him walk me into the cabin and all that stuff. I remember just being so shaken and smacked by the reality of it. It almost felt like a panic attack, so I sat down in the shower with my head between my knees, and I cried until it ran cold. I got out and woke up my roommate to tell him all about it. He calmed me down a bit. So while I still have an active grinder account, I really just use it as an ego boost. I'm reluctant to meet up with anyone from it now. 
anyway, girls and gays, I suppose the moral of the story is that we gotta be damn careful out there. In high school, I had to write a paper which summarized my life story, starting from birth. I reflected on my earliest memories, and when I remembered this, I had to sit down. My heart pounded as I realized what had actually happened, and what my four-year-old self couldn't understand. When I was a kid, my family often vacationed with their friends' families, and we'd all lived together in a giant beach house or cabin for a week. This must have been one of the first of those vacations. I wanted to hang out with the rest of the kids, but since they were all at least one year older than me, they thought I was uncool. I followed my sister around the house, but since she didn't want to play with me, I mostly just eavesdropped on everybody's conversations. One day, all the kids happened to be in one room, no adults, plenty of toys. Hella fun. Off to the side was this tiny door, the tiniest I'd ever seen, which led to a dark, empty room. I remember we were absolutely fascinated by that tiny door, and the older kids would make up stories about it. Jennifer was the eldest, and in my memories she's a teenager but that might have been skewed since I thought everyone in the double digits was super mature. She even knew how to use her mom's cell phone. All the kids were playing, having fun, enjoying their childhood. Then Jennifer got a call. She had to ask us to be quiet several times, and she sounded really serious. I thought this request was silly and a little annoying since I really wanted to play. When the call ended, Jennifer told us, My dad is coming back here soon. Jennifer's dad had driven away for a few hours, but now was driving back. Someone asked questions about where he went and what he was doing. I think she said something about drinking. At some point, Jennifer addressed all of us and said something like, My dad looks at kids and takes them on drives. You all have to be really careful when he comes back. I couldn't grasp anything else, she said. Then she talked to a girl and a boy. I noticed he was looking at you two a lot, so both of you have to be really, really careful. I think he wants to take each of you on a drive, but don't go with him if he asks. Their conversation went on for a while, and I felt jealous that they talked so much with Jennifer and that her dad was looking at them instead of me. Why wasn't I so special? I grew bored of listening to them and went back to playing. The car pulled up and Jennifer told us to go in the tiny door room. We brought some toys along. I was psyched to go through the tiny door, but it ended up being a dark, empty room without any fairies or hobbits. After a while, we left. As far as I know, nothing bad happened on that trip. I grew up with the two kids Jennifer talked to and they seemed pretty well adjusted. But Jennifer and her family never vacationed with us again. I told my family this story, and they thought it was an imaginary memory that my four-year-old brain concocted. My parents are positive that there weren't any weird, creepy, or alcoholic dads there, just their good friends. My sister didn't remember any of it. I can't rationalize how or why I would have imagined it. My childhood was great. I had no concept of anything bad until I was like 11. Luckily, this experience did not ruin tiny doors for me in the slightest. I love me some tiny doors. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear then a day later, another friend of ours drove up. He was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs, since there's only two bedrooms. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote, and of course there's absolutely no lights outside. 
It's the woods with coyotes howling and bears, but nonetheless completely normal activity. On the night that our friend drove up at around 12am, my boyfriend and I were in bed when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods and that the motion light came on and that there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin. He even goes outside. Nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm a naturally very anxious and scared person while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical while I tend to jump to the worst case scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin. So he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my god. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is a 180 pound CrossFit coach, and to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods looking at us. At this point, I'm thinking he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open the window. I'm so scared, but trying not to show it, as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes go by, nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there's five people in a tiny room, and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30am. I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that it's totally fine and he understands. So we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend. He looks at me. And then the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else was staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier, because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. He's on the phone with them and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us we're too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3 a.m. and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep and the next day we talk to some of the locals of the area. We told them our power went out and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out there is because of a snowstorm. He said he couldn't explain it. So, to the man in the woods who might have cut our power, let's not me. This story starts out with four of my friends who are Adam, Frank, Randy, and Jay. Adam booked an Airbnb for his birthday, and we were planning to just relax and drop some acid. Me, Adam, and Randy have done acid in the past and it was a great experience. For background purposes, I've experimented heavily with acid for the past three years, dropping upwards to almost five tabs at once 
so I know what to expect when doing acid. However, this trip caught me completely off guard. Frank and Jay have always been curious about acid and wanted to drop it with us for their first time. We're all close friends, so we thought it'd be a nice experience to try. So, we get to our Airbnb, which is a cozy two-story wooded cabin. We all decided to take one tab each. Frank and Jay were hesitant on taking one full tab, but eventually agreed to it since we were all going to take one full tab. This is where I should have realized that maybe we should have taken half or even a quarter since I didn't know the dosage of each tab. However, I've always got acid from this dealer and knew he was a reliable source, as my previous trips were always safe regarding the doses and legitimacy of the LSD. Okay, now we all take the tab at 3pm. For the first 45 minutes, it was all going well. We were watching the Garden of Words and talking about life and our relationships and such. About another 45 minutes pass, and this is where the red flags start popping up. We all decide to go downstairs and just chill while I make food. Frank, Adam, and Randy are starting to lose themselves. Their sentences become incoherent and are unable to understand what me and Jay are saying. Even though it was Jay's first time taking acid, he held himself together quite well and was taking care of Frank, Adam, and Randy. Adam then stubs his toe on a chair and starts bleeding. This is when the nightmare starts. Adam is in pain, and he starts to say, security check, about every 20 seconds. I believe the injury towards Adam's toe started making him paranoid about the whole cabin, as he rented it in his name and wanted to make sure it's safe and such. So, for about 30 to 40 minutes, he's repeating the phrase, security check. During this time frame, Frank and Randy are tripping out hard. They're starting to lose themselves completely. Frank is talking incoherent gibberish with Adam while Adam is in pain and repeating security check. Randy is sitting down by himself, completely out of his mind. He couldn't understand a word I said or what was going on. So me and Jay help the three of them upstairs to relax and lay down a bit. I bring up the food I made while Adam is still saying security check over and over. This is when Randy and Frank fall asleep. We had some nice lo-fi beats playing to lighten the mood, however, I don't think this helped. Me and Jay are still in our right mind and just chilling until Frank wakes up and starts acting strange. He tried doing a judo move on Jay. Jay thought this was normal behavior because we're into combat sports and spar a lot. This was the first big red flag. Frank then goes to me to try a judo flip on me, but I counter it and we end up in bed. I asked him if he's good, then he quickly replied, Yeah, I'm good. It was awkwardly fast. Every time he talked, it was like he was rapping like Eminem. This is when stuff gets weird. Frank then goes to Randy, who is sleeping, and proceeds to gouge his face out while asking Randy if he's okay. Frank keeps his fingernails really long for some reason, so if he goes to Randy's eyes, it would have been bad. We move Randy away from Frank and try to get him to relax a bit because right now, me and Jay start to realize that Frank is not okay. Frank then starts to flip out. He falls onto the floor, then slams his leg onto Randy's head, who was sleeping on the floor. Frank is still out of control, rolling on the floor back and forth and getting into weird, contorted positions. It was like his body was from the movie The Exorcist. He was also chanting and mumbling random stuff while flipping out on the floor, like a psychotic crackhead. At this point, Adam is coming back to his senses. He looks at Frank in confusion. Now this is when it really hits the fan. Upon seeing this, I go to the speaker to turn down the music. This is when Frank stands up and walks towards me, asking me what I'm doing. I say, just turning the music down bro, as I'm still a bit freaked out by him. He pushes me violently aside and proceeds to grab the speaker. He smashes it on the ground. 
He then grabs the cord that was attached to the speaker and pulls on it while screaming. What does it all mean? At the top of his lungs. This scares the life out of me, Adam and Jay, all while Randy is still asleep through all of this. At this point, we're all freaked out by what Frank does. Frank proceeds to walk to the staircase, but along the way, he palm strikes Randy, who's starting to sit up. This causes Randy to fall back to the ground and go to sleep again. I'm not sure if it knocked him out or what. Frank also strikes me in the jaw right after hitting Randy, causing my jaw to slightly dislocate. While this is happening, Adam tells him to chill out, and I kid you not, Frank responds in the most demonic voice. Chill out. No, you chill out. He sounded like a legit satanic demon saying that. After Frank hit my jaw, my first instinct is to clinch and take him to the ground. We hit the ground and I pin him with the help of Jay. Remember, this is Jay's first time taking acid as well, so he's freaking out by whatever was happening to Frank. Frank is violent and he's strong as hell on the ground. He's struggling and chanting random stuff to himself like he's possessed or something. He breaks free a couple of times and attacks everyone. He smashed Adam's face in with a closed fist repeatedly until I got him off him. He was kicking anyone in front of him as we tried to pin him, even trying to bite us. He would scratch, hit, bite, or do anything he could do to harm us. Every time we pin him, he arched his back like that one scene from The Exorcist where the girl is walking down the stairs like a spider. Thank God I knew Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because Frank looked like he was set on killing all of us. This was a nightmare. His pupils were dilated to the point where his whole eye was just black. He would glare at me and Jay as we pinned him down, and this was so creepy I thought he was a demon. Frank is screaming gibberish and making weird noises while trying to contort his body like the girl from The Exorcist. At times he would arch his back and stick his tongue out while trying to throw up, while making the most demonic noises I've ever heard. What he was doing was straight up from a horror movie, and it creeped me out. At 8pm, this is when Randy wakes up. He couldn't believe what was happening. He thought that he had died during the acid trip and he was now in hell. Reason being is that Randy sees that I'm bleeding and my face is swollen while pinning down Frank with Jay all while Adam is having a mental breakdown witnessing this. Randy says to himself, Frank would never hurt us like this. This isn't real. It's just a dream. He then proceeds to scream, Jesus Christ, at the top of his lungs repeatedly. The screaming triggers Frank to fight us even harder. Randy screams Jesus Christ and recites Bible verses for at least three hours while Frank was trying to fight us. During those three hours, me and Jay are pinning down Frank, who's tripping out harder and harder as Randy keeps screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly. Frank then screams and makes demonic throw-up noises while trying to get loose as a response to Randy's religious babble. Imagine this, one guy screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly and saying Bible verses at the top of his lungs, while another guy is actively trying to harm you as you pin him down all while you're tripping on acid still. It was a nightmare to say the least. The screaming, chanting, and constant fear of being maimed was all that me, Adam, and Jay could think of at the time. Adam recollects himself and begins watching Randy and calming him down while trying to get him to be quiet as the neighbors around our Airbnb are still awake. 11 p.m. hits and Randy snaps out of it. A few minutes later, Frank then snaps out of it. I didn't know for sure if he was back to normal, as he asked us for water and stopped fighting us. Me and Jay cautiously let him up. However, Frank has his back turned toward me. In case he went apeshit again, I could quickly get to his back and choke him out, so we could restrain him. However, he was normal again. Me, Adam, and Jay experienced the chaos and destruction done by Frank and Randy, who weren't aware of what they were doing during their psychotic trip. This trip made me realize acid is not for everyone, and that we should have taken some precautions beforehand.
Psychedelics can either be a heavenly experience or a hellish nightmare that won't end. Frank and Randy didn't realize how serious the situation was until we told them afterwards. To be honest, I'm not sure if they realize the severity of what me, Jay, and Adam experienced that night. I thought I knew what I was getting into, but I will think twice the next time I try LSD with anyone. We all remain friends to this day, but me, Adam, and Jay will remember the nightmare hell of a trip that we experienced. This trip will forever be ingrained in my mind as the worst LSD trip I've ever experienced in my life. I needed to get this one off my chest. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor, and I were playing hide-and-seek in the forest, and the only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too, and when I pointed it out, they confirmed it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it, and I can't remember how long we did, but we reached a small cabin, and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point, and curiosity got the best of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside through a window, and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars, and a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled for the other kids to run back the way we came, and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and didn't stop until we were inside the house. I locked the door behind us. I remember getting into trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what I saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not sure if even what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sound of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults that stayed over after a party that was going on. They all had their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard through the kitchen window. She said they found the body of a woman in the forest, in a cabin where her killer was staying, and there was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night and the glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopters above. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin and what we saw. Maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to go anywhere near that tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. This is a story my ex-sister-in-law told me a few years ago. I've known her for 17 years now, and it was the first time she'd ever told me this story. My sister-in-law moved to Provo, Utah in 2001, from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She'd only been living there for a little over a year when this took place, in November of 2002. As she puts it, she was still getting used to American culture and customs, 
and as such, was still a little naive. She promises this is something she'll never do again. Now for the story in her own words. It was a snowy night in November back in 2002, and I was driving home late from work one night. I drive slower than most, even in the best winter conditions, because high speeds give me anxiety. I only take the freeway if I absolutely have to, but I stick with regular as much as possible, just like I was this night. I was taking my time as I drove home in quite the snowstorm. I came to a stop and noticed a man with crutches walking along the side of the road. I felt bad for him and decided to pull over and give him a ride, which of course he accepted. I wasn't scared or nervous at all to offer this stranger a ride because after all, this is Provo, and I'm from Rio de Janeiro. I felt very confident in my street smarts, especially in a smaller city like this. We started with just small talk, which was pleasant, and that evolved into a lengthy conversation. As the conversation progressed, he began to ask me some questions about myself, including what I did for a living. I told him and in turn asked him what he did for a living and what he was doing on the side of the road in the middle of a snowstorm. He told me he'd just been released from prison and was going to his friend's house. When he arrived, he found out his friend no longer lived there, and he was just wandering around because he didn't know where to go. You're probably wondering what his answer was for what he did for a living. Well, what he said after I asked this question chilled me to the bone. He simply told me, I end people's lives. He then proceeded to give me some very sound advice. He said, you are a good person, but what you did for me today, I don't want you to ever do again. It's dangerous. There are a lot of bad people out there, and today is your lucky day. With that, he asked me to pull the car over, got out, and we went our separate ways. I had goosebumps the entire time she was telling this story. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I'm very thankful she has not done that ever again. It was the spring after I graduated college, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I decided to take a pause and ride my bike down the coast from Canada to Mexico. I was pretty nervous to be going by myself, but for the majority of the time, I felt safe. Halfway through or so, I got pretty comfortable with sleeping alone in fairly empty campsites, parks, and wherever I could. There were even some stretches on the trip I rode with other bike tourists. This one encounter, however brought my guard back up for the remainder. I was halfway down the Oregon coast and was a mile or so from the campground I'd planned to stay for the night. There was this notable yellow car that had passed me, headed in the opposite direction. When I pulled into the campground, I stopped at the information board to look at the map and fees. As I'm sitting there, I see the yellow car coming down the road and it stops where I am. This older guy in his late 50s or early 60s gets out and starts looking at the board with me. He's friendly and seems completely normal, charismatic even. He's asking me about my trip and starts mentioning how he's from the area but has never checked out this campground. At this point I'm still pretty naive. There's plenty of nice people I've met on the trip that chat me up and ask me about the bike tour. He's talking to me and getting closer and this part is what starts to make me uneasy. He would repeatedly reach out his hand to shake mine like he was about to leave, but every time he shook my hand, he would grab my forearm with his other hand and do this weird gasp laugh thing. The way he did it looked insane, and the arm grasp was very firm. It sent shivers down my spine. Then he dives into another topic, and repeats this freaky handshake maybe two more times in between. I realize that I'm completely out of sight from anyone in the campground. I have no cell service, and I'm now very close to him and his open car door. 
There's a knot in my stomach. I'm on the verge of tears and my voice is shaking with every response. At the time, I didn't even know why, but something felt very off about him. I finally speak up loud and tell him I'm going to get going. I run to my bike and speed to the campground. When I get there, I don't even try to find the hike and bike spots. I just throw the tent down directly across from the camp host. Again, I had a lot of encounters with random strangers at this point, but none of them terrified me like this one did. I fought with the idea that he was probably just an overly friendly guy, but the fact he would repeatedly grab my arm and laugh was frightening. All in all, most people I met were very sweet, and it made me very trusting of others. Even if he was harmless, his actions were a good reminder that I had to be mindful of my vulnerable situation and be more alert. When I was 16 or 17, I was coming home to Brooklyn from a movie in Manhattan with my friends. I was the only one who lived in Brooklyn, so I walked home from the train alone. I was used to being out late by myself. I had a midnight curfew, but I frequently broke it because I thought nothing bad would ever happen to me, despite an uptick of assaults in our neighborhood at the time. This night, however, I was actually slated to get home on time for once. It was a summer after I graduated high school, and I was feeling amazing. I'd had a little to drink and a little to smoke, and I felt like I was on top of the world. It was so hot out, I remember that I was wearing this long sheer cape thing with a very tight and revealing little dress underneath. However, because of my fun little outfit I was wearing, and being so stupid, taking selfies while I walked down the streets and listening to music with both headphones in, not paying any attention to my surroundings, I think I even sang as I walked. I got to my building after finishing my 10 minute walk from the train. I walked up the steps to my apartment. I lived in a brownstone with apartments in it, and mine was on the third floor. We had a gate at the bottom of the steps separating us from the sidewalk. I pulled out my headphones and began to fumble with my keys at the top of the steps. Just as I'd found the correct key, still humming to myself and thinking about my great night, I heard the latch on the gate clank as if it were being opened. I turned around and I saw a man standing at the gate, staring up at me. He was young, probably early twenties, wearing a grey hoodie with the hood up. It was covering parts of his face, but I could see his eyes. And immediately I knew something was off because of how blank yet nervous his expression was. One hand was on the handle of the gate, as if he were about to open it completely but stopped once I turned around. Somehow, my fight or flight instinct didn't kick in yet. It was probably the alcohol. I cautiously called down, can I help you? And he didn't respond. I looked him over more closely and realized then that his other hand, the one not on the gate, was moving fast and low near his waist. I registered that he was touching himself gasped, and within milliseconds, he was sprinting up the stairs behind me, reaching out his hand to grab me. My brain clicked into place and I started screaming at the top of my lungs as I jammed my key into the door and slammed it behind me. I ran up the stairs to my apartment, screaming for my dad, not even stopping to make sure the door was locked, thinking that if he followed me upstairs, he'd soon be met by my very tall father and our very loud dogs, who slept in the bedroom right next to our apartment door. As I looked over my shoulder while tearing my way upstairs, I saw his face pressed up against the glass window, still watching me, but now his eyes were furious. I ran into our apartment, still screaming to my parents to call the police. My dad went downstairs and looked around but the guy was gone. The police came anyway after my mom called them. They came upstairs to take my statement so they could make their report, 
The two cops showed up and asked me to describe him. I did. They said they'd cruise around looking for him, and regardless if he was found, a detective would call me to make a more detailed report. They never called me. There were many more sexual assaults that continued to take place in my neighborhood for the rest of the summer. I shudder every time I think about what would have happened if I hadn't taken out my headphones before I began unlocking my door. I don't know how long he was following me for, and as far as I know, he was never caught. From that point on, for those last few weeks before I left for college, I would call my dad and make him meet me at the train station just so I could get home safely. Now, as an adult, I am far more cautious than I was as a teenager. I'm always extra aware of my surroundings, especially at night. I don't look at my phone while I walk home. I'll never get the image of his blank stare as he lunged towards me out of my head. I will never forget the feeling in the pit of my stomach as I realized that he followed me home and was now waiting to strike. It was like being a deer realizing it's being stalked by a tiger because the tiger accidentally stepped on a twig and gave itself away right before it could pounce on its prey. So this happened around 10 years ago when I was still a university student and a pretty naive girl. I had a late class and after that, I hung out with my friends for a while. Soon I started to feel sleepy, so I decided to walk home. Being very socially awkward, I tried to avoid the main streets because it was full of people. So last minute I took a different route from the usual one. As I made my turn to the left, I got an overwhelmingly eerie feeling in my gut. I brushed it off since I was walking in a familiar neighborhood not too far from where I lived. As I was thinking that, I noticed the shadow of a tall man behind me. My first instinct was to change course, but I didn't want to be judged as weird. Also, another guy further down the road was walking the same direction as me. The shadow behind me kept growing as he was coming closer and his pace kept getting quicker and louder. My heart was beating like a drum. This went on for an uncomfortable amount of time when suddenly the steps stopped. I decided I was going to turn around and look, but before I could react, I felt a strong shove from behind. As I stood there, frozen in shock, the man sprinted past me. The other guy who was walking in the distance turned around, came to me, and asked, Hey girl. Did that other guy bother you? That seemed suspicious since he wasn't even looking my way. How would you know? Nothing happened, I replied. My brain was screaming, danger. He started following me, saying things like, you look like you need my help. We should get to know each other. Go away. I don't need you. Leave me alone, I said, trying to get this guy off my back. I was so scared and needed to think fast. My first thought was calling a guy to scare him off. My boyfriend at the time would always reply to my calls three hours late at best, so reaching him was not an option. My best friend, I thought to myself, she'll answer for sure. As I called her, the guy started getting agitated. Hey baby, when are you coming? I happily yelled. The guy sarcastically asked if my boyfriend was going to come beat him up. I looked him dead in the eye and replied, He's going to beat both of us when he gets here if you don't leave right now. I think that must have scared him because he started backing off. What made things even creepier was that he went in the direction that the tall guy ran towards. When he left, I ran home and cried. I didn't take that route for a long time. I feel like this was all choreographed against me, but I was lucky enough to overcome it. If it was later in the night though, I can't be sure.
This happened in 2019. I no longer have contact with this person. When my husband and I lived in our first apartment together, I did not have a job. We had just moved to a new city and I had trouble finding anything. Naturally, I was at home because of this. Every day at the same time, I would walk my dog Remy. We would always walk the same route, in front of the leasing office across the street, by the basketball courts, and by the tennis courts before walking the rest of the property of the apartment complex. The first encounter I had with this guy gave me tons of red flags, and I did report him to the leasing office because of his behavior. As I was walking Remy back home, this man who looks like he was in his 40s, glasses and gray hair, was walking from the basketball court to the sidewalk. I stopped with Remy because she was going to try and jump on him if he got close enough. He noticed us and asked, Is she aggressive? I told him, No, she'll just jump on you. And I know some people don't like dogs or dogs jumping on them. He looked me up and down staring at my chest for a second. Then he asked if he could pet her. I said sure, because Remy's tail was going a million miles an hour. She was whining to meet a new person. He started to talk to me while he was petting Remy. I'm Joe. I just moved in across the street. What's your dog's name? I was nice to him, even though I had a weird feeling while talking to him. This is Remy. I'm Megan. I live next to the groundskeeper with my fiancé. You'll like it here. The staff are awesome. The entire time I was talking, he was petting Remy and staring at my chest. Joe thanked me for letting him pet my dog and then turned around to leave. I was weirded out, but brushed it off. I told myself it was probably nothing. I walked Remy the rest of the way home, but I noticed that Joe had went into the entrance of his apartment building, but he was watching me walk home through the glass. I hightailed it the rest of the way to my apartment. It had freaked me out enough, so I called the leasing office and told them that Joe watched me walk home after meeting me, and that I was generally uncomfortable with him. I also had them come fix the blinds in our dining rooms, because I didn't want anyone looking inside our apartment. After I loaded myself into the car and drove myself to my mother-in-law's house, I stayed there until my now husband got home. Any time I walked Remy and eventually Peach, my other dog, Joe always was somehow outside when I was. He always tried to come talk to me or pet the dogs. Luckily, when I would walk Peach, she would growl at him. If I ever walked the dogs with my husband, he would never come talk to me. It was only if I was alone or with Remy. He would also start walking by the front of our apartment when my husband wasn't home. He would try to look through the sliding door to get a glimpse of me. My husband and I decided to move into a bigger apartment because we needed more space for the dogs and ourselves. The day I got the keys for our new apartment just down the street, I had another experience with Joe that made me call the cops. I was walking both of the dogs around the block so I could finish up some last minute packing. I saw Joe pull into the complex in his car. I stopped to let him go past me, but he waved me to cross the road. When I did cross, he pulled around really fast with his window already rolled down. Hey Megan, I was wondering, are you happy with your husband? If not, I can help you out. He looked me up and down and gave me a wink. I acted like I didn't hear him since I had headphones in. I immediately went inside and locked the door behind me. I called the leasing office and told them what happened. I also let them know I was going to call the cops and at least make a report because his behavior was freaking me out. I wanted to at least have it documented. I called the non-emergency line and an officer came out. I told him what happened that day and some of the creepy behavior Joe had before. The cop asked me, do you want me to give him a warning not to talk to you? I said yes. I thanked the officer for his time and he took my name and phone number down. We went to the leasing office to talk to the staff about the situation. About an hour later, the cop left. He gave me a call. 
He told me he's talked with the property manager of my apartment and he also rent Joe's license plate. He told me his name and told me that the leasing office said he has other complaints from other tenants on file. He also mentioned he didn't get a chance to talk to him because Joe was leaving as the cop arrived at the leasing office. I thanked him again for his time and finished packing. I decided to go to the leasing office to talk to the property manager so I could clear up anything just in case. When I got there, the manager told me that Joe had multiple reports just like the officer had told me. She also told me she was going to have our on-site officer stop and talk to him and encourage him not to talk to me or other female residents. I thanked her and went home to start moving little things until my husband got home. I went almost six months without another incident with Joe. We moved to the third floor and he didn't have any idea which apartment was us, so he wouldn't bother us. I also made it a point to have the dogs on a certain schedule, so I would never run into him if we were out. The last time Joe tried to talk to me, I turned around and walked away. I didn't let him get a word in. I did notice him harassing my neighbor outside while she was grilling one day. I told the leasing office about it just in case. A couple of months later, he moved out because they wouldn't let him re-sign his lease. That's the last I saw of Joe. I carried a stun gun with me when I walked the dogs or by myself because of him. I was fully prepared to shock his ass a couple of times if he ever got close after I called the cops on him. I'm a new homeowner and had recently had to call a plumber. Not knowing anyone in my area, I did the usual. I pulled out my phone and googled who was near me. I found a local plumber and he came out that day to unclog a pipe. He seemed decent enough, so I scheduled a needed sewer scope with him for the following day. He misses the appointment time with no communication. After a couple of hours, I call him and he reschedules for the next day. He misses the second appointment by a couple hours, so I call him and tell him not to come at all. He apologizes, saying he's the only one working. He does the sewer scope and tells me I will need to replace the pipes from my house to the street. A month goes by and I try to make it through the holidays before this pricey expense. I decide to give this guy another chance. He misses the first appointment, once again with no communication. He reschedules it for the following morning at 11am. Not surprisingly, he misses that appointment and won't respond to my calls or texts. I have a family member call from their phone and he answers, and he says he will be there around 4pm. By this point I'm fuming because time is money for anyone. At 4 p.m., he never shows. At 7 p.m., I decide to send a strongly worded text explaining how he has no regard for anyone else's time, and that's not a good way to run a business. I also state I will be reporting him to Better Business Bureau, so hopefully he doesn't waste someone else's time and money. Here's where it gets creepy. He immediately calls me and says he's on his way, and he has with him the machinery to dig up my yard. I tell him no, not to come. I will have someone else do the work. Mid-sentence, he hangs up on me. I'm sitting in the living room on the phone with my dad when I notice his truck park up in front of my house. He doesn't get out. He just sits there for about five minutes. I'm getting creeped out, just watching him sit in front of my house. My dad tells me not to open the door. Finally, the guy calls my phone asks to talk to me, which I inform him that he already is. He then gets angry at me, telling me how he doesn't appreciate me contacting Better Business Bureau and he spent a lot of money renting the excavator. He says that he's here now and can start digging up my yard, even though it's dark out. When I try to get a word in, he just cuts me off in an agitated tone. At this point, I hung up on him 
he sits in front of my house for another five minutes after I hung up the phone. He's just sitting there. He then texts me and apologizes for his attitude and getting angry with me. He tries to make excuses for his behavior and asks to please let him have the job. I've never felt so unsafe in my own house before. My wife and I recently purchased our first home after the birth of our daughter. Everything was as you would expect the first few months. Painting, decorating, renovating, basking in our newfound slice of the American dream. You get the idea. Unusual things started happening several months ago. One day as I was getting home from work, I passed by a strange truck two or three houses down from ours. I say strange for a few reasons. We know literally everyone in our small neighborhood and I'd never seen this truck or person before. There's no reason for through traffic to come down our street and the truck was driving very slowly. Like, put it in drive, but don't press on the gas slowly. As I pulled in the driveway, the truck flipped a U-turn and came back towards my house. Getting out of my car, the truck crawled by and the driver stared daggers at me as he passed, and then sped off. I don't like to judge based on appearances, and I like to think that I don't scare easily, but something about this guy's eyes gave me a bad feeling. Obviously, this was weird. I mentioned what happened to my wife, telling her we should be more mindful about security. When I told her the type of truck, my wife said, that same truck drove by and the guy stared at me when I got home this afternoon. I thought he was just being creepy and checking me out. I tried to tease her a bit to lighten the mood, calling her cocky for assuming a guy was driving by checking her out. I didn't want to freak her out but I was definitely worried. We saw the truck a few more times over the next couple of weeks, either driving by slowly or parked down the block and facing our yard. But one day, the truck stopped driving by, and we haven't seen it since. I sort of dismissed the whole thing as me being paranoid. Then other things started happening. In the past month or so, my wife and I have been hearing tapping on the windows at the front of our house at night. It's happened two or three times to each of us separately, always around 10 or 11 p.m., and always a soft but distinct tap, tap, tap. It sounds like knocking with a single knuckle on the metal part of a screen door, if that makes sense. The first time that my wife and I heard the tapping together was last weekend. We were in the front room playing with our daughter around 9.30, just about to settle her down for bed. Our front room has a large, almost floor-to-ceiling window running the length of the wall next to the front door, which faces the street. We were all sitting on the floor with our backs to the window, reading our daughter a book, when we heard it. Tap, 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 tap. Now, our house is older. Creaks and cracks are not uncommon, but this sound was so distinctly intentional that my wife and I immediately looked at each other and bolted up out of the room. I had my wife and daughter lock themselves in the back room while I turned all the lights and did a sweep all around the outside of the house. Of course, I didn't see anything. I was ready to dismiss the whole thing as more paranoia over something that probably had an innocent explanation. Until last night. Around 9.45, we heard our daughter making noise in the baby monitor. I waited a few minutes to see if she would settle down, but when it became clear she wouldn't, I got up to put her back to sleep. The layout of the room is important to visualize this next part. This room is on the other side of the house, but the exterior wall juts out a bit in an L shape, and the corner of this L is made up of windows. If you're standing in the door to the room, you are directly across from these windows in one corner, and there's a rocking chair in the other corner, pointed toward the front of the house. One window faces the street, and the other faces our neighbor's house. A garden bed planted with small shrubs wraps around the outside of the house, directly underneath. 
I was sitting in the chair getting my daughter settled down. I had a lamp on so the room was softly lit. Once she fell asleep, I stood up and put her in her crib when something caught my eye. There was a figure standing about a foot away from the window. In the bare space between the shrubs and the house, they were staring at us. I didn't look long enough to see anything more than what appeared to be a man in a light grey hoodie standing a few feet away on the other side of the glass. Sprinting from the room, I brought my daughter back to my wife and I's bedroom, leaving her there while telling my understandably confused wife to lock the door. After turning off all the lights inside the house and turning on all the lights outside, I began moving from room to room, peering out the windows into darkness. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. Whoever it was must have taken off after seeing me notice them and made a quick exit. Obviously, I had some trouble sleeping after this. I spent hours checking security cameras and going from room to room looking out the windows into the night, hoping, but also not hoping, that I would see anything that could explain what happened. This morning, I went outside to the spot where the figure would have been standing. I thought, hoped, maybe there was a plant or something that I mistook for a person. When I got to the spot, I realized the figure had to be standing exactly in a bare patch of ground, about two feet in diameter, directly in front of that window. Part of me is still hoping that I'm being paranoid. The mind can play tricks on you in the dark, seeing things that aren't there, especially when you're a sleep-deprived new parent. But with everything that's been happening, I can't shake the feeling that there was actually someone out there last night watching us. Please let me be wrong. And to keep everyone updated, nothing happened the next night. I expected that would be the case for a couple of reasons. First, so far all of these events have taken place a week or two apart. The tapping this weekend and seeing the figure two nights ago were the closest in time of any of them. Second, this person absolutely realized I saw them. I really wouldn't expect them to be so bold as to come back the very next night. I still stayed up and kept an eye out though. I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I looked young for my age. My family and I lived out of town, about eight miles out. Our little community was next to a highway. The school bus would drop me off two blocks away from home. One day, I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me, so slow that I figured they were just looking for a house or something. I ignored it and walked to my house. That was the end of that. Consistently, this truck would follow slowly behind me, after a couple of days of this, I walked into my house and looked out the window. Inside of the truck was an older man and a black lab. He was staring at me, idling inside of his truck. And then he pulled away. I decided enough was enough. I told my parents. Of course my sister was quick to jump in that I was lying, but my mom thankfully believed me. She drove me to the bus stop the next morning. The red truck was there, across the street at the gas station, pointing toward the bus. I got on the bus and my mom decided to drive around the truck. She described the scene. The man was disheveled and dirty, hunched over in his seat, just staring at the bus. His license plates were caked in mud, so she couldn't make them out. It freaked her out so much, she called the police and the school. I went to school and was quickly pulled into the office. The man had been spotted at the school, waiting in his truck. That day I rode the bus home. This time, the truck was parked along the street. I would have to walk past this man's driver's side door to get home. I debated, considering running for it. Apparently this man was getting desperate now that he was spotted. A police car showed up and I talked to the policeman. They went to go talk to the man. 
He quickly pulled away from the curb and took off down the highway. I never saw him again, and I don't believe that he was ever caught. Because of this experience, I am extremely guarded and paranoid with my own daughter. The world is a terrifying place these days, and children go missing so easily. I don't like to think about if I'd been grabbed. I wouldn't be here telling this. My kids wouldn't exist. I was lucky. Many children aren't. So, to the stranger with ill intentions, let's not meet. This happened back when I was 17 and living in a small rural village. I had been at a friend's house all evening, watching films and chilling, and I left to go home at around 11pm. It was quite a long walk back to mine, as she lived on the outskirts of the village, down some back roads. I felt relatively safe, as when it got to a certain time of night, it was quiet. You wouldn't bump into anybody, and there would hardly be any cars on the road, especially at that late hour. It was weirdly peaceful. Where I lived was a large avenue with two big blocks of houses, like two big circles that you would get to after following a small dark road that consisted of a few large old houses and a vicarage. As I'm passing the vicarage, I see this little beat up red Nissan Micra coming towards me. I mean there was nothing subtle about it. It nearly came to a full stop as it drew alongside me and I started to panic. There was not another soul about, just me and this strange guy. I was determined not to get myself into a tiz, so I picked up the pace and refused to look at him. As far as I know, he drove off. I continued walking home, which was literally a straight line from there, and I kept listening out for a car engine and was vigilant of any headlights creeping up behind me. I heard nothing and saw nothing so I breathed a sigh of relief as I could now see my house. I walked in and locked the door, and I saw my mom stood in the living room chatting on the phone. I'm trying to interrupt her conversation, telling her about the weird guy in the red car, when for some reason she goes to the front window and peeks through the curtain, and she takes the phone from her ear and says, What? That car? This is all in a minute since walking through the door, and I'm thinking to myself, it can't be him, because if he'd followed me, I would have heard the car. Before I even get a chance to look for myself, there's a knock at the front door. So I go and answer it, only pulling it open a few inches, and there's this guy stood there, empty-handed, wearing a baseball cap. It was the same guy and the same car. I just stood there and said, can I help you? Did you order a pizza? He asks me. I say no, I think you have the wrong house. Taking a step towards me, he says again in a not so messing around kind of tone. No, I said, did you order a pizza? Before I reply, my mom's come up behind me and opens the door fully and says, Is there a problem? This causes him to back up, mumbling. I must have the wrong house address before he gets in his car and takes off. Me and my mother were both a bit spooked and made sure every point of entrance in the house was locked up properly. So, to the stealthy, alleged pizza guy who stalked me home, let's not meet again. This happened when I was about 8 years old. I went to the big science museum in Canberra with my family whilst we were visiting my stepdad's family. We were all in the same section, but my mind wandered off to a different area where some guy was giving a presentation or something. I'm just standing there listening when some old guy stood behind me and he put his hands on my shoulders and started rubbing them like I was his daughter or something. I freaked out straight away and moved away from him, still keeping an eye on him and feeling very cautious. 
A woman comes out of the toilets right next to where we were. She looked at the man and then looked at me, and she walked over and stood next to him. I went back to my mom and told her what had gone down. I don't know what that couple were planning, but I had a feeling I could have ended up in those toilets.